How many people can say they ran away to join the circus as a child or toured the world as a top sports junkie before being thrown into solitary confinement behind bars? How about getting stabbed, shot, or standing head to head with John Gotti, a mafia kingpin after beating up some of his boys, or becoming New York City's godfather of A-list parties. The guy Hollywood spotlighters like Leonardo DiCaprio, Oliver Stone, and Jack Nicholson called when they wanted to hit the town. Mark Baker managed to squeeze all this into one lifetime. His body is a map of tattoos, scars and lines that draw parallels to his days of living in fifth gear. He now finds himself on a tropical island surrounded by a pack of wolves. Yeah, actual wolves. And it raises the question, where does someone's body, mind and soul end up after living a life of such excess? Well, to get the answer, we usually need to start at the beginning, right about here. Are you ready to hear a story? I mean, the whole fucking thing will just be that beer just, can yeah, and my just, voice. It's like two beer cans just talking to each other. <laughs> just, like, have you met Mark? <laughs> Mark Summer Pale Ale it, Baker. It's all, it's all in the it's all in the edit. Right? Nice. We, we know that. Well, mate, good to have you here. Thanks. Are for we coming on? We're rolling, mate. We're rolling. We're rolling. Yeah, just let's get great. into it. Well, great to <laughs> see Athron. Okay. We're back in Seminyak. Um, Gosh, so many memories from this neighbourhood. Um, you know, Bali's mid eighties, late eighties, when everything moved up from. Um, from Kuta to Legion, into sort of Legion Seminyak border, which we're in right now. Um, it's such a wild period of time to, you know, I didn't come here till early 2000s and then I moved here in 2008, but your period, like when did you first move here? I first, well, I first came to Bali. Um, I'd been on a hiatus. I was in New York City. I was in the club and restaurant business. Um, actually, I was collecting debts at that time. But I uh, came to Bali um, after a sort of four-month trip through uh, through through Asia, Thailand, Burma, or well, it was back then, down through uh, Java, um, all the way down to Bali. Fell in love with Bali the moment I arrived here. I knew what it, I, I had always had this sort of vision and this passion for what Bali was going to be about. And I was, you know, attracted to it. You know, Bali either. It's you, such it, a classic thing, isn't it? That it people lo- just come here and they, you know, so many people just get that absolute raw connection where they're like, oh my God. And I some people don't. Some people nearly yeah. end up dying and then they have to leave and the energy is too much for them. Um, I always knew I would love Bali. And, and throughout the years of, this you know absolutely insane life that I've been leading for the past sort of forty years. Um, you know, I always knew from day one when I when I got here that um, this place was absolutely. Special. I knew it before I was here. I knew mm-hmm. Bali is very special and magical, and it just it was just everything. I mean, I get goosebumps. Were, while I were you it. looking? When you say you found Bali and you've and you've had that feeling at the time, were you looking for a place to get away to and start fresh? Was there something going on in your life at that time that you needed to move from? Well, from, yeah, or? I mean, look, you know, I have a you know, I have a, a long and colourful would be an under understatement, um, you know, life since since childhood. Um, so well, let's go back and start. But yeah, j- j- just as a as a sort of PS on that, um, yeah, I, I was I was in New York City. I was. Hitting it hard. Um, I was, you know, I'd moved from England, um, the skateboarding history of, you know, Dogtown and my skate my skate career had come to an end and I was in New York and I was obviously hitting it seven days a week, seven nights a week. And um and and I just, you know, I took this I needed a time out. Um I was twenty, sixty two, seventy eight, I was like twenty years old, twenty one years old, twenty two years old. And it's um young. Yeah, well, you know, yeah, I started young <laughs> and made it to Bali. I just, I just, just knew. I knew it before I got here. And when I got here, I was like, "Oh, this is it." And what Bali ended up being for me was was this sanctuary where I would come. I would limp in um, in August, um, you know, completely broken. I hadn't slept in fucking months. You know, we'd been partying very hard um, and working hard. And you know, New York City is pretty intense. And what I was doing at that at that time was was extremely intense you know i was up in the bronx and south harlem um i was delivering furniture i was debt collecting you know i was debt collecting must have been an interesting line of work well it was you know because it was the start of the crack epidemic (laughs) and i was a white boy with another this crazy israeli ex-paratrooper and we were going up to the south bronx and harlem and you know burnt out neighborhoods wasn't buildings we were and we were carrying of course we were Wow. Guns and handcuffs and God knows what. What what sort of uh 
level of expertise or experience did you need to get a job with that kind of degree it, of de- it, debt collecting? It, it, it actually started. I mean, I, I, I'd arrived in New York and some friends of ours, some Russian friends of ours, and, you know, the Russians were starting to move into, uh, you know, Brighton Beach, you know, which is out, out, out on the outer skirts of Brooklyn. Um, it started off, we were, you know, I had a job as a, as a furniture delivery guy. I was, you know, a friend of ours at a company and I was delivering furniture, you know, humping sleeper sofas up 18 flights of, you know, cracked out, piss ridden, horrible stairways. Brutal on the body. And then if they didn't pay, I'd have to go and take it back. <laughs> so right. That, so so that, you were both, you played both roles. Well, yeah, I started delivering and eventually I was like, fuck this, I'll just go collect the money. You know? Right. So, uh, <laughs> we, we, like you, you suggest you were working for a particular company and you said to the guy, I'll go get it back. No, you... it was just sort of morphed, you know, it was, you know, as, as the Russians gained presence um, in, uh, in New York and, and Brooklyn, you know, especially Brighton Beach um, before, it all spread out. And again, the whole Russia story is a whole other story. But but no, I started delivering furniture and then, which is brutal, you know, New York City and, you know, 103 degree humidity. And it was the crack epidemic. So I was going on, me and this crazy guy, Ron, were going to the absolute worst neighborhoods on the planet um, um, as I, as white boys. I assume a lot of them didn't have elevators. Well, most of them or didn't. Well, they worked. were broken. And, yeah. and uh, you know, we were, they just didn't know what the fuck to make of us because, you know, we were these two white boys with, and he had piercing blue eyes as well, and and they they were they just couldn't figure out if we were cops or absolute right. fucking villains. <laughs> Take your pick. You know? So um, so yeah, it was you know it was it was incredible because most people don't get to see that side of New York City. Mm. They stay in Manhattan, Lower Manhattan, Midtown Manhattan. They only see the glamour and the you know the skyscrapers. I guess they, they see it in the movies. See it and, in the uh, movies, and uh, the movies don't even come close to how mm. rough and tough it was, especially during the crack epidemic, because people were just absolutely out there, strung out. Um, shootings, you know, I mean, I was, you know, when we were delivering or collecting, I was involved or in the middle of so many shootouts and, and, and police raids and, you know, I mean, just. In what, in what sense were you involved in shootouts? Or oh, I'd be, shootout? we'd be walking into a project, you know, if you look at a project, a project is basically, you know, a group of buildings, um, you know, 20, 25 stories high with a courtyard and, you know, people are basically shooting at each other out the window. Right, yeah. Um, and outside the front of every project you had a gang, you know, you got Crips and Bloods and mm. uh, what were back then, Latin Kings, you know, they were all, all the local mafias. And then, of course, you had the whole crack epidemic, which was territory and people fighting and shooting for territory. And then you had the cops that, you know, went, if they dared go into these some of these projects, you know, w- w- would, would go in and do a raid. And when that raid was going on, I was, you know, we were in the middle of the courtyard, and, you know, hiding under, you know, when I was delivering, I was hiding under furniture while they were all shooting at each other, you know. On the other side, when I was collecting, I was, you know, trying to find an exit. And you know, people, were, I mean, it was just, it was insane. You must have had some pretty insane moments while collecting, considering you're going into projects like that and demanding that people return furniture. Yeah, I mean, I was fair. My, my, I had a, <laughs> my nickname, or well, my work name was Mr. Sharky, you know, like, like, you know, right. that debt collected shark, the shark, loan shark. Oh yeah, but I wasn't right, a loan shark. I, I was actually a, I was actually a bit of a pussy because, you know, if they couldn't, if they were, if they were robbing the company, because we eventually started selling jewelry and TVs and valuables and stuff like that. Um, so I'd have to go and you know repo the, the, the goods um, if they didn't pay. But it wasn't that if they could, if they really couldn't pay, I you know put the file at the bottom of the file and it would be. You know, three four months before it came up again to the top of the pile. Okay, sure. So I mean, if they were robbing the company, then I'd go get the money. You know? Right, so, but I, there was a measure of leniency. For abs- you. I'll do. I was, I was giving them money, and I was going. Sure. There. I mean, I guess if you're going into those places, you can certainly see firsthand the struggle abs- struggle town people are in. Abs- you know, I mean, you, you you know, you know, I mean, the Bronx was a rough place, and if you have a fairy and they're trying to raise kids and. See these Spanish, Hispanic families, you know, obviously, you know, you've got Dominicans, Puerto Ricans, you've got Russians, you've got South Americans, Colombians. Um, and of course, you know, you had, the, you had the black neighborhoods too. And that's when I started to, you know, I mean, back in the day when rap was starting on the street and Biggie Smalls was out there on, in East Brooklyn. And, you know, so I had, I had contact with, with, with all of these, but I saw that whole sort of, you know, the, of the voguing movement, you know, you had the, you had the whole rap movement, you know. So What's the rap movement? Describe the rap movie. Well, the rap movie was like, look at Biggie Smalls, you know, he was right. rapping on a corner. Oh, or rap. Sorry, yeah, I yeah, thought rap. Said rat. Yeah. No, rap. <laughs> rap, rap. I was rap. like, you were there when the rats yeah, invaded yeah. New I mean, York? Hip hop. <laughs> I was always being rats in New York. <laughs> but no, the whole hip hop movement was incredible because you had these, you know, these, these, these young black street kids that were just learning how to, to rhythm and rhythm and rhyme. And mm. they were just, and they'd be rapping to anyone who would listen. So, so I, I got to see Biggie and his crew out, out, out in East Brooklyn. 
And he, you know, he was like 18 years old. He was sl what we call slinging crack. He was mm. like dealing at the same time. He was rapping. They, everybody wanted to break out, you know. And then, of course, a couple did break out, and the whole, you know, the whole, the whole, the whole rap movement started. Run DMC, all of you know, Def Jam, all of that. So I knew, yeah, I knew, wow. I was right there in the middle of all. I saw, you know, the American culture from the dark side as well. Mm. Because the dark side became, you know, it was pretty rough up there. It was, you know, people were getting shot. It's all interesting when people like that become massive celebrities and become famous for what they're doing. Well, the, now, like yeah. people can often look at them and go, well, why, why, aren't, why are they still acting like gangsters? But look at what they've, imagine having coming from that background and then suddenly having a shitload of money. That's the <laughs> whole know, like, debate about, you know, the whole East coast, West coast rap war. Mm. Um, you know, the, the record companies and you know, shoot night and, you know, death, death row on, on, on the, on the West coast and bad boy. And, you know, all the East coast. I, I, and, and what's funny is later on, you know, as, 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 as time went on and I started, you know, I got out of collecting and was started promoting clubs and this and that, um, you know, then I started owning clubs was the, you know, a lot of those guys who, who came up, you know, Puffy, Biggie, all of those guys, they were coming to my clubs. Mm -hmm. So I was, in, it was, like, you know, from way back then, I was probably one of the, one of the few white boys that, you know, not, was not only there, but actually survived, you know, being in that environment out it's there. Interesting. And, and I knew him. I just did a story on, uh, the last Bent Planet uh, story I did because I do kind of animated stories of, of people in crazy situations. The last one I released was had an element of puff in it. It was a uh, about uh, Whitney Houston's uh, husband Bobby Brown being Bobby, kidnapped by the preacher crew and right. taken into the Bronx. You and, bet, you bet. Yeah, and how and it was and he was actually lured out of Club New York where Puff Daddy and J Lo used to hang out. So. Okay, they, they met. I think I would say they met at Lotus. Lotus was probably one of the most famous clubs in New York. It was right. One of one of mine. That uh, was one of your clubs. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And uh, and I had Greenhouse and Limelight and you know, Tunnel. I was actually running Tunnel for publication, but no, I had you know over over the course of you know I mean. I guess that I'm not sure if you know that 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 reputation was Godfather of New York, which apparently I was. I was I think it was more like grandfather. <laughs> but uh, I mean, that's a wild position to end up in. Like, can we just zap back a bit? Yeah, let's because, start because you know this is it's wild to hear. One, you know, I'm hearing that you were the Godfather of New York, uh, running clubs um, in that that whole debt collection Bronx. You know, well, let's go back to the, let's go back to the beginning. And yeah, and since then you've you've been running clubs and you have a pack of wolves in Bali. That's <laughs> I mean, they're, they're huge jumps in a lifetime. Where did where did this all start? Let's go back to the beginning. Um, gosh, where were you born? Where, well, where how, much time, how much where time? Did you, where, did you, where did you where did you grow up? In a long story short, I grew up. Uh, I was born in Brighton, England. Um, I, most of my family died when I was very young. Um, when I was eight years old, um, I was pretty much self-sufficient. My mum uh, was doing her best, but she'd lost control of me by that point. Was that through uh, an accident or something? That yeah, my you... just my you know my, my father died of cancer when I was two. His brother died in a motorcycle accident. This mm. one died. Of, I mean, everyone fucking was dying. Wow! And I had to, and my mum basically had a, was having multiple nervous breakdowns over Fair the loss enough. of my father. I had a brother who was five years older than me that was trying to keep it all together. But by the, I'd already learned how to survive at that point. Mm. And um, then I joined a circus. The circus came to town. I went for a job one afternoon. I think I was eight. I was eight and a half. Yeah, eight, eight years old. And the circus left town and I went with it. Wow. Yeah. You actually ran off with it. Did you run away with the circus or well, was this a... I drove off with the circus. <laughs> <laughs> but but I look, it sounds, sounds glamorous. Yeah, let's go to this. And parts of it were incredible and the characters... But in all honesty, it was absolutely fucking sinister. And the people who were with circuses are, you know, all some um, the talent side of things. You know, all the all the all the artists are obviously the Russians and the trapeze and the lions and the tigers. That's all glam stuff. You know, I was I was part of what we call the advanced crew, where we would go ahead two weeks ahead of the show, put up all the posters, fly, drive around town, right. dressed up as a fucking monkey on top of a van. You know, singing the circuses coming to gotcha. town and all of that. What was the actual moment of going in and and asking for work with this as an eight year old? I mean, how how did the owner even the, the owner even the, question the, your age? Uh, yeah, but he was a sinister character. Sure. I mean, so there was zero fucks about we, how old you we are. Don't, or... We don't have to go down that road, but yeah, I was. I had a pretty brutal. And uh, a dysfunctional childhood, put it that. But I learned how to survive. You know, I mean, if everyone's did uh, anyone at that circus take on a parental role? Yes, for you? absolutely. And, and and that was the which later on is just. I mean, this you know, I mean, this is movie stuff. But uh, yes, of course, I, there was a, Rus a troop of Russian trapeze artists with their three boys. 
um, and the husband, and she was incredible, and she took me under her wing, which was great. And I was nine, eight, nine years old, and I was traveling with the circus. People were getting shot, and, not shot, stabbed and killed at wow. various locations we went to because you had, you know, the fair boys, which is all the... I'm not allowed to say the word pikey, am I? But you had all the fair, you had all the fair boys. <laughs> You're free to say whatever you like and, in front and then, of me. <laughs> and, then the, and then the circus ring boys, and every time we'd meet in, you know, Liverpool or, or Doncaster or fucking London or Shepherd's Bush or whatever, there'd be absolute, mad, you know, there'd be murders going on. I out. imagine the people that, yeah, that, sure, as you said, like it sounds like a glamorous romantic notion to run away with the circus, but a circus <sighs> cannot be made up of completely emotionally stable, functional oh, no, people. Everybody, trust me, everyone who's working in the circus is running away from the law. Right, I, could yeah. get, I guarantee you that. And, and so were, then within that environment, that, you must have so much conflict. And well, I was carrying a fucking, I was carrying a gun when I was nine. And I was really? Like, wow. To, yeah. So and uh, was was that given to you by someone? I picked it yeah. up in one of the cities, you know, one of the towns we went to. Right. And uh, but but there's also the glamour side. So you know, back to the matriarch of this Russian you know, trapeze group that in in I, she took me under her wing and she could see I was alone and you know the, the whole scenario was a bit dark. You know, again we don't have to elaborate. But uh, that's great it, that she took you under your wing. Yeah, it was wing, great. Right? You know, and then as much as possible, you know, I spent time with her. In years to come. <laughs> In years to come, which is quite ironic, her sons, who were around about a little bit older than me, um, became some of the most prominent Russian gangsters. Really, well, wow. on, on the planet, yeah, these guys are, became incredible guys. You know, obviously, I had a relationship with them. But when I when I started going to Russia many years later on, and you know, the what we call the Sonsieska Bratva is is the sort of Russian terminology for mafia mm -hmm. and uh, these guys were running the biggest show and they were moving into into new york and and then when, of course when we rekindled off and i was going to moscow and i started and i met when did when did you rekindle what sort of a gap was it there? was uh 90 that was i mean if you're talking i was with the circus in say 70 71 and then when i first went to russia which was in 1994 uh, my partners opened up uh, the first club in moscow and then I, and then at that time they had that whole sort of what's called the pooch, which is like the revolution and Yeltsin and, you know, they were shooting at the White House and, you know, we had a hundred journalists and celebs that were the models that we'd brought over from New York. Um, we had to leave really quickly, but I started to go back to Russia and I was actually in Russia like four or five times a year. Um, that was predominantly in the club world. Yeah. You, yeah. You I was, I was, clubs there. yeah. Cause you know, Moscow was opening up and. You know, I did. I did the you know the Forbes magazine launch there, and it was a big deal to have like you know the Capital Tool magazine was you know with uh, I forget his name, Miguel Miguel Forbes, um, and you know they opened up the magazine, and of course the first issue was great. I did the party. It was I was doing Russian Fashion Week. I was doing all the big events there, bringing celebs in. I was bringing in you know, all those male people that you know. That, mm -hmm. I mean, it was a fucking, it was like a candy factory over there. I mean, the Russians were just, I mean, some of the girls were just absolutely gorgeous. So that attracted, you know, the, the Mickey Vaux and the Sean Pans and, sure. and all the rest of it um, who, were, who were friends. So, um, And that's when you got, you basically looked up your old yeah, exactly. stepbrothers, just, basically. Just before then, you know, it was, I heard and I was like, I know that name, hang on. And then we met, you know, and then we started, yeah, it was just, I mean, you know, can you imagine meeting somebody? That wow, way? how many years had it been since you'd seen them? 21, 31, probably 20 years. And it was almost unexpected to, to I mean, completely here. unexpected i had no wow. idea what had happened to them i mean i looked up that's incredible you know, that, that whole circus life i sort of the circus i was with was called chipperfield circus um which was probably the biggest circus in england europe at that time so we toured but you know you had the, you know, the russian state circus but we had we had russian artists and you know eastern european artists mm. but yeah it was completely out of the blue and when we hooked up and and then somebody sort of let me know who was that quite emotional for, for yeah both, absolutely for yeah. of course i didn't get to see i didn't get to see the mum though but apparently she was sick but um but no we rekindled it was like see i was like my mm. god and these guys are like serious motherfuckers you know what i'm saying I mean, wow like, 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 really i mean they must have did they 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 since looked after you when you've been in russia or were they looking after you at that time in I russia because to comment that. <laughs> 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 yeah i have a great relationship with russia man because it, it was it, look it was cowboy town and and I was in New York and I had clubs and restaurants and we were like, you know, New York City was the hot place on the planet for clubs. It was at that time between sort of 94 to 2005 when, you know, New York was the epicenter of everything. And unfortunately, you know, me and my team had, you know, the, probably the most high profile clubs and we were doing events around the world, Cannes, Monaco, Fashion Weeks film festivals everything and because we had a big celebrity base in new york um every time we went to a film festival or a fashion week of course all the models and all the celebrities would show up so i would do collaborations with paris milan london stockholm 
Asia, wherever. Um, and then I, I just saw what was going on in Russia and I was going there a lot. So I just wanted to bring Russia into the fold because I knew that the Russians eventually were going to be able to break out of Russia, which they weren't at that time because of the... So this is before Russians started coming into Exactly. New York. Well, they were coming into London first because uh -huh. London just didn't care. They just wanted the money. Oligarchs were making billions of dollars when the war, you know, sort of the war came down. But when, when the Soviet Union started to break up, um, you know, there was a big rush to, to sort of grab those steel, zinc, oil mm -hmm. industries. And these young 30, 32 year old, 35 year old guys made a grab and, and became sort of multi-billionaires over life. They didn't want to stay in Russia. They wanted to go to London, buy property, you know, London property prices like Have tripled, tripled in fucking three years. But and America didn't really want them. So what happened was eventually over time, um, you know, I, you know, I'd, <laughs> I'd arrive in Moscow and, you know, FSB would, would pull me over and have a chat. And then I'd, and see what I was doing to promote Russia and bring money and celebs, which they were happy with. And then I'd get back to New York and the FBI would pull me up and say, oh, wow. like, like, who's, you know, who's, like, who are they, like, who's making moves in Russia? And well, there was that. certainly a lot of tension at that time. Between, yeah, between but no, but they were, countries, the so. Americans were interested. So, I mean, I mm. won't make too much of a drama. It was just, you know, I just said, look, look guys, I love going to Moscow and I love, and, you know, my world is nightlife and, you know, bringing people together. And, uh, but I did help, you know, people through, you know, State Department there had you know musicians. There was, there was a whole. Uh, so how did you coming from like let's go back to the circus like coming, you, you're traveling with the circus. You've run away at eight. You've become right. you've got your basically your stepmother and, yeah. and your brothers, <laughs> and then you you were with them for how long? This cir the circus on and off for uh, uh, nine, ten, eleven. Uh, on and off for like three, three years. Right, and um, then and then you moved into what? Yeah, then it then? got then there was some uh, lots of issues with. People got killed uh, in a city we were That's in, in, a city, issue. in Reading. Um, a couple of guys got killed, and cops came in, took me home, and I'd, they'd really take me backwards and forwards a few times. But this time they were like, you know, that's it. You've got to, you've got to stop. Mm. And my mum finally sort of stepped in and said, you know, this, you know, she kind of woke up. I mean, I love her, but you know, you don't. The fuck was she thinking, letting a nine-year-old boy run off with a fucking? So circus, she was just right? emotionally unstable, she, and she basically she felt like I mean, she was amazing. She did her best, but mm. she was when she lost my father, um, you know, a man she loved very much. Um, she had, you know, she had to take care of us. We, we had no money, yeah. um, and I was just a wild kid, you know. And she I, saw that as an opportunity for you to be looked after. And she, she kind of figured I knew what to, I knew what to do, you know. I, mm. I was taking care of myself, and you know, you know, she, you know. She did her best. She did her best. But uh, but so no. There, so there were murders within the circus. Yeah, environment. like I said, when we come to you know we come to a town and you know the the fair was in town and the fair, and all the you know, fair boys and the ring boys got together. There were obviously clashes and fight. You know, mm. British, British youth culture is to fight. You know, whether yeah. it's a football team or whatever. You know, you go there and that's how you earn your your street credibility. So team gang, it's which fucking, side that, you want that's, orientated. That's isn't your it? whole life. That's working class England mm. is about scrapping. You know, yeah. that's what we did. We fight and uh, <laughs> and you know. I mean, I think we invented football hooliganism. Right? So you know, blah, blah blah blah. Time went on, um, and then so I got brought back, and I got I got placed at a. I was the charity case at a very famous English public school, a uh, boarding school, which was the best thing that ever happened to me for the brief time that I was allowed to be there, um, because otherwise, God knows where I was going to go. I was heading absolutely in the wrong direction mm. at that age. You know, being that experienced of life and everything else, absolutely. You know, yeah. you know at, at sort of ten, eleven years old. So. So I lasted a year, year and a half, and then I got kicked out or asked to leave. And then I went back to Brighton um, and, yeah, I was just I was just like, fuck, what do we do now? Because none of the schools wanted to take me and I didn't want to go to school. So you're what, 16 now? Did no, you say? I'm 14. Oh, 14. 13, okay. 14. And, um, and uh, this new phenomenon started called skateboarding. <laughs> And, you know, I had, everyone was at school. I wasn't going to school. Um, so I just started, you know, a friend of mine gave me a skateboard. My friend, Gary Mann, bless him, um, gave me a skateboard. And I started skating. I had so much time on my hands and I loved it. You know, it was just I could put all that potentially destructive energy into something positive like skateboarding. And then it blew up. Skateboarding blew up. And I was quite good at it, apparently. <laughs> I mean, you must have been obsessed with it. because I you, was if obsessed. You, that's, they are literally the perfect yeah. ingredients to become really great at any any sport or passion, really, when I mean, you've got that anger and you can't focus exactly. it. Exactly. You you've got all teenage energy, it's, angst. And, and, all, and, all and, and, and I'm carrying, you know, quite a lot of anger and disappointment mm. at establishment and, 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 and adults because of the mental, sure. mental and physical abuse I've been through. So, um, so yeah, and that's why I just kept skateboarding and I just more and then competition started and we'd be getting these magazines, um, you know, every month, um, from America and we'd always congregate at the skate store called Max's and, uh, we see all these, and then we'd see these 
guys called the Dogtown Boys, you know, Tony Alva, Jay Adams, Jimmy Plumer, Hackett, Paul Hackett, Dave Hackett, Steve Olson, all these fucking legends and the blue California skies and they were wearing, the, you know, the hats and the, you know, the outfits and the Dogtown Boys were the bad boys of skateboarding. Stacy Peralta and, you know, that whole Bones crew was was a little bit later, but they, uh, they you know, they were the good boys of skateboarding. Mm -hmm. And so we, of course, identified with the bad boys. <laughs> and then um, and then chance would have it, you know, I started winning competitions and magazines started. So I started to get on all the covers and interviews and all the, all the magazines and stuff. Plus I knew how to milk it by then. You was know it I mean? a healthy – well, did you find also, because you, you just said you came from a – you know, that scrap mentality, everyone fight each other sort of thing. Was there a more of a healthy competition within the skate world or was yeah, it still, well, what sort yeah. of rivalry was it? Well, the rivalry was basically London and Brighton, you mm. know, and, and in Brighton, we were all on the street, you know, and, and there was the kids at skateboard and the place we used to hang out. It was a big shopping centre in Brighton called Church Square. And, you know, all the villains would be there fencing off all their stolen goods. You know, there'd be little crews, clicks going off for a day and fucking robbing post offices and, building societies and that and they'd be coming back and so it was this like den of iniquity around right, but i but yeah. i just focused on skateboarding and, and tried not to dabble too much in the in in the other stuff um uh which was quite difficult because it was everywhere you know everyone this has got kids yeah i mean it's it's so easy to just go down the wrong path especially that old especially you... brighton you know i mean brighton's you know the whole the home i don't know if you're familiar with brighton but you know quadrophenia was filmed in brighton the mods the i know Rocket. brighton because of great bands like portishead and yeah, uh exactly. um you know that, that kind of movie, fat boy which, slim and those guys they were yeah. the, but, but yeah prior to that you know i mean we, we had you know punk the mods, the rockers, they'd come down every bank holiday weekend and stuff, scrapping each other. So like, in, <laughs> there's always scraps. There's always fight in, <laughs> in the music the scene. English people <laughs> just like fighting each other. <laughs> so um, so skating, yeah, the skating thing started. And then and then one day my manager, I got a manager now, <laughs> you know, I'm getting paid 50 pounds a week. Hey, that must have been an incredible feeling for you to go. You yeah, have no idea. I had yeah. no fucking clue. I, all I could see was a potential life sentence ahead of me. Was it a real fast switch from what the fuck am I doing with my life to suddenly I've get, I'm I'm getting attention for something I love doing. It wasn't a fast switch and it was a it was a it was a gradual process over over about 18 months where skateboarding just blew up and I just started to see it you know I was getting on again all the covers of the magazine but I knew how to I, you know I know how to manipulate I'm sorry I don't know how to charm I know how to be I, all the it right makes words. sense that you would have it, uh, having, it, come, it comes from the heart it comes from the heart having well having that kind of a childhood you know exactly. leaving home and joining a circus and like that's a real environment for having to manipulate just through survival. That's I just had to survive. It yeah. was, it's, in fact, it's always been about, you know, it's, it's always been about survival. Mm. You know, it's each chapter of this fucking wacky, crazy, incredible life that I've had has always been about survival. It's, you know, what do we do next? You know, and, mm. and constant reinvention. So skateboarding blew up, you know, this, and then I get this message on Mark, you know, the Tony Alva, you know, the fucking king of Dogtown's coming to England. And do you want to, do you want to do a show with him? Do you want to skate with him? I'm like, are wow. Fucking, are you fucking kidding me? Of what course. an opportunity. And uh, he came and we did a show together and our managers loved what we were doing. And we went, so well, let's go on tour. So a show is like literally just a massive big, yeah, what, we, what, what we, you got, a half pipe or something? Yeah, it was doing? a pipe pools. You know, we'd show up. I mean, and of course, all the pools in England were pretty shitty. They weren't that good. Right. So you'd have crowds of people and media all coming Three, to watch four, you guys. Three, four, five thousand people, six thousand people show up. Right, and, and yeah. It was Mad Dog Tony Alva and Mad Mark Baker. That was apparently my yeah, name. Yeah, wow. Mad Mark. So we did these shows and, and I, it was just like, holy shit. And then Tony says, well, you know. When the tour was over, he said, damn, we, that was fun. You know, do you want to come and stay with me in California? I said, do I fucking what? Of course I do. Damn, so that was your ticket to the USA. I was 15 years old. Uh, <laughs> I got a 55-pound Freddie Laker ticket from, from New York to Los Angeles. I'll never forget it. Wow. Um, and it changed my life. I, it was it. That was it. I was out. I'd escaped a potentially awful fucking... What was the – do you remember the the feeling on that flight? Because I can that, remember that I can remember the music I was listening to. It was like Breakfast in America yeah, by Supertramp. There you go. I was I mean, fucking I blasting can... it. I was sitting at the window looking out. Look, look, I got goosebumps and I mean I'm nearly a couple more beers. I'll I start, mean, what a I'll start crying. Good. <laughs> Get it out. Um, I mean that's such it a pinnacle was moment. Fucking surreal. It was just I remember it like it's clear until I was fifteen and um I just bounced. I was like, that's it. This is it. I gotta go for this. And um, and I had you know I didn't know what I was going. I mean, Tony was there, but you know whether he was going to show up at the airport or not is another another story. But I was like, this is it. I've got to take this chance because if not, I'm, my life is going to go completely the wrong way. And um, you know, and I was skating good. So then I went to Cali, and you know, Tony showed up at the airport eventually, you know, a couple of hours late. <laughs> and, uh, and we started skating, and I was crazy. I was you know, I was a crazy skater. I had lots of energy. Do you think that your 
you know, and I imagine you were saying like so many kids that were skating were just kids on the street. Do you, I imagine that like part of the ability to skate that well is the fact that you just – You've been through so much shit. You don't give every, a fuck about taking chances every, and hurting yourself. Exactly. And that's why I got, you know, broken wrists and broken ribs and broken ankles. I just, I, I, when I went into a swimming pool and I was doing a show, I just took out every fucking bit of anger that I had on that coping. Wow. And, and when I wanted to do an aerial, you know, some people like what we call a pop out their aerials. But, and, and, and we invented most of this shit. So, so it's all very well for you know, with respect to the kids these days that, that can see a trick, see it can be done and then do it. Nobody knew, it, this was all new. So we, yeah. we were inventing rock and rolls, board slides, hand plants, no hands aerials, fakies, ollies, I mean, the lot. So I just, you know, go out and fucking blast a five, six foot aerial out of a swimming pool that's already three, four, five meters deep. <laughs> oh, people would absolute. I mean, I knew how to put on a show. <laughs> and I guess you would notice, like, as you gave slang terms to these things you were doing, you would notice the terms start spreading and probably we, hit a magazine we, and then bang, that We was made name. it up as we went along. Yeah. I mean, look, let's look at Van's tennis shoe. I mean, of course, and then the whole culture of, of, of what, you know, bigger than skateboarding, well, not bigger than skateboarding, but a part of skating was, was that, you know, we started this whole, I say we, and I'm probably talking about, you know, 50, 60, 70 guys, whether it was like, you know, the, the Santa Cruz guys, the Dogtown boys, who were the, the primary ones. But we were like Vans tennis shoes, for example. You know, they were, I still call them Vans tennis shoes, even though they're called Vans now. <laughs> they were tennis shoes. Right? Yeah. And people, because of the crepe sole, was really flexible. You wore them a couple of times. And you could feel the board underneath you. But, of course, they were white. So we'd go out and skate. And I was look, looking at Tony one. I was like, these, are, these look fucking gay. <laughs> white fucking tennis shoes. <laughs> so, like, well, so Tony picks up a, a crayon and starts painting, you know, blue and red. <laughs> and you no. all know where blue and red <laughs> fans come <laughs> from, right? So then we were like, well, there was black, white, green. So that's how it all took off. God. And then, of course, we are like, oh, these fucking skateboards, like, you fall off and you get smashed in the ankles. So they made high tops. And... The rest is legendary because wow, every every, ki I, every kid on the planet owns a pair of Vans. <laughs> yeah, and I, and they're so synonymous with skating. I mean, I don't skate, but I've got Vans, and every yeah. time I buy a pair of Vans, that's all I wear is black is Vans. Yeah. Thank you for making them black, by the way. <laughs> <But> like, <laughs> well, at some point they did take over, start no, yeah. to make these crazy color sure. combinations and the signature stuff. But that's at Vans, and then you get to you know Vision Streetwear. You know, we, I mean, like you know, we had a culture and we had a lifestyle, and. You know, it wasn't just California shirts. It was the shorts. It was the things. And then we started moving into pants, jackets. So, you know, Vision was probably one of the first to Vision Streetwear. And that all comes from our era of skateboarding. So so it wasn't just the skating and the moves and, and you know, all the tricks of which we paid heavily and broken bones and blood. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, and then, of course, the quality of the skate parts got better. Um, you know, wood was introduced in half bikes, which made it a lot softer to land on than, you know, the, the, the knee pads and elbow pads you had, you could slide out. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm on fucking, you know, arthritis pills every day in my life. Now, yeah, I can't, well, otherwise, I can't get out of bed no more. What would know? be one of the worst breaks or body destruction moments <sighs> that you, you felt? On a skateboard or a motorcycle? <laughs> Let's start with a skateboard. <laughs> I just broke everything. My, yeah. my wrists. I, and then I tape them up and get them. But I wasn't the only one. Everyone was doing it. We were mm. so addicted to skateboarding. It was unless you unless you couldn't fucking walk, which which was also the case. You know, we. we you know, you do an ankle or a knee, you're fucked. But it was just, you know, we were just so in love with school. We were, we were nuts. I was sure. at a world speed record. I think I did 72 miles an hour in 1979. Wow. You know, which is world's unofficial back then. But and that, we and were that, just nuts. And, but, but we had to keep pushing the envelope. You yeah, know, that's the, what I was about the, to say. The, the crowd demanded it. Exactly. You know, they didn't come to see Mad Mark. They didn't see me watching you and you've got around. your comrades exactly. who were all just like, you know, And we pushed each, each other and we cranked the music up and, you know, probably do a, line of speed or something yeah. <laughs> it's, I'm it's... joking about the speed but, um, <laughs> you know, and just uh, and just uh, and just absolutely go out there and put on a show and you know and and, and then you know there was this whole thing between skaters of, of like you know there was the guys that were Tony Hawk you know bless him you know Tony was the next generation or two generations after after us but you know he kept the flame alive when skateboarding died and skateboard st parks started to close and sponsors ran for the hills and you know BMX came in and rollerblading came in so you really noticed uh the, the the phase in the massive oh, in fucking, the bigger public arena just oh, went boom, and my moved. whole fucking world fell apart. I thought wow. it, we all thought it would never end, and of course, you know, I'm now 19. I'm you know probably considered at that point definitely probably the best in Europe, but definitely one of the top five in the world. 
Um, I thought sponsors, this, that. I mean, we were kids. We were getting taken advantage of as well. We weren't getting paid proper royalties. They were abusing our images, you know, shoe, and, shoe companies that, that you know, paid us. I you know, have a free pair of shoes while they made yeah, $150 right, yeah. million. Dollars, yeah. But um, it, 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 And then it was just I suddenly started to see all the parks were empty now, all of this. I'd been going to Sweden a lot then. I'd been doing shows up in Sweden. And of course, there were lots of beautiful girls in Sweden. My gosh. That and um, <laughs> fell in love every week. <laughs> then, uh, At that age, you just wouldn't know oh what was going God, on. Oh, my God. I was just like, oh, gosh, that's so nice. And, uh, so, <laughs> and then I was, I was in, back to dreary England. And then I could just see, you know, I wasn't getting booked on so many shows anymore. The, this park was closing down. And I went to a, you know, I mean, I was you know, putting you know, five, seven, eight, ten thousand people for a show. And then one by one, the parks closed and the, you know, the, the things didn't come in and my manager's sales went down and he's like, well, I don't know if we can afford to pay you oh, wow. the money anymore. And, and that was it. Were you on really good money at that point or were you just... I mean, I, I was... They were keeping you happy with sort of candy money? Or? I mean, I wasn't getting paid a tenth of what I should have been getting yeah. paid, that's for sure. But, uh, but, but it was no, enough I, at that age to be I like, I'm set. Care. I didn't have to... I didn't have to put a mask on and go get my money. It. Yeah, <laughs> it was, yeah. it was, I was, it was absolute for me. I, I was doing it for free. I mean, mm. to pay my food and plane ticket and wherever, uh, and yeah. I'll be fine with that. So, so it died. Um, then I went back to Brighton and um, I'd been going to Sweden. And then of course I got into some trouble and um, uh, I was in prison for a while. Can we go into that? Which uh, it's, yeah, of... Back in the 80s, look, everyone was smoking weed and hash, you know. One day, everyone was smoking, and I didn't think it was a bad thing. Uh, look, now it's legal, but... but somebody... People don't really think it's a bad thing anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I know, yeah, I was, I was like hurting for money, and somebody one day says, hey, Mark, you know, can you get me some hash? I, was like, I don't know where to get it. And then, you know, a couple of hours later, somebody says, well, look, I've got all this hash. Do you, you know, so I was, I'll connect the two of you. I didn't mm. think about it. I really didn't. It wasn't, it wasn't my business. It wasn't, it was just, I connected them. And then, you know, so now we're talking, you know, Hells Angels from, from Copenhagen and where they're taking, you know, kilos of hash. And, and I was like, oh, cause it's getting a bit serious. So I think I'll just step. Oh, so it began with a simple connect. Yeah, like that. it was a simple connect, but and suddenly then... it was like, well, now well, if he's got, has he got a couple of kilos? You know? I mean, um, that's a, that's a pretty understandable way to get into any business. When something suddenly you you connect two people and you suddenly have a massive amount of cash for my, it. a skate buddy of mine in Copenhagen was a, was a skate buddy. His brother was like one of the head sort of leaders of the Copenhagen Hells Angels, whatever. And then we introduced and blah blah blah. And then somebody else in another country close by, you know, they you know, this kid wanted this guy wanted you know to see if he get hash. I made the connection. I walked away from it. I didn't even really think about it because mm. it wasn't until a year later on that it all came on top and. And I was, you know, set up actually uh, to take a fall for some people. Damn. Um, and you know, blah blah was blah. Was that a um, an emotional betrayal as well? Yeah, absolutely. It was a friend of mine. You know, wow. and he set me up like a. But I knew he was setting me up while he was doing it. I could, you know, when when the whole thing was going on. Um, so anyway, blah. It happened. I went to I went to jail for a while. I couldn't now, tell anyone. I'm nineteen. Oh, that was just when you were nineteen. Yeah, still. Nineteen. I was in solitary confinement for seven months. Oh, um, wow! So you've gone from skating around the world and just thinking it's never going to end to being in solitary confinement and being told I was going to be there for the rest of my life. Yeah. Oh, so you didn't even know it was only a seven. No. Month, well, well, the seven month solitary was while they were conducting the investigation. All right. And so, um, as far as you knew, while you were in there, and you... the cop was crooked, and he was trying to fuck my girlfriend, and oh. he was planting evidence. God, and, yeah. No, that's a, that's a, that's a movie in his, in his own. Wow. But, so um, what? Give me a give me a flash of what was going through your mind while you were sitting in that. Well, I was like, you know, three days in, I was like, well, can I get an attorney, please, because I want to get bail and get out. And they're like, well, mm. sorry, we don't have bail in our country. <laughs> wow. You're going to be this here. Is, which you're, which country they were in? Can't tell you. Okay, Scandinavia. Okay, Scandinavia. And, yeah. uh, oh, so you were, but but basically you were in a foreign country. Oh as yeah, well. absolutely so foreign even, country. Yeah. You didn't even have the feeling of like at least outside this cell. I, I, I couldn't even tell my mother I was there. I mean, as much as, oh, as broke God up as she damn. was, if I told her, I'd be. So there was only two people or three people. I was writing from a PO box number for like a year and a half. <laughs> wow. But then eventually, you know, the cops' corruption came out, and I was, you know. Sort of what do you call it uh, mitigated of, of, of what I was accused of. Oh, really? That was the that was the turning point. Is is the cop being busted for corruption? Yeah, well, they gave and me a life, they gave me a life sentence, which there was twelve really? was twelve years. And uh, yeah, it was it was a fucking it was a, a movie. It's more like a nightmare. It was I was in a foreign country. and I didn't have you know my didn't have the funds to to hire good attorneys, and the attorney was in cahoots because he was a drunk with a cop who was a crooked cop. I mean, it just goes on and what on. What was but... your mental state like in that cell uh, uh, when you it, thought it was it, all over? Good question. It was uh, It was you know, sitting in solitary for, for that long is a real 
uh, a lesson in patience. Let's put it that that way. You know, I mean, you couldn't take a piss without knocking on the door. Do you feel like it, it at that age with that sudden? I mean, that's a horrendous mental state to be put into. Do you think at that age? And it, I couldn't share it with mum and dad. Oh, or this one, said, I, no I was emotional support. Alone. Only my brother. He was the only person, one friend. Do you think could, it, it actually matured you, or or did beyond, it just stunt you, or which no, which could, direction? I mean, you know, it caused some damage. Not damn it. No, I learned from it. Mm. I said, well, I'll never fucking go back. I know that. Yeah. You know, I mean, I always think, I think everybody in their lives have done something to, so they've done something that could put them in jail, you know, and I just didn't want to be that. I, I'd escaped all of that in Brighton when I started skating and all my friends were in and out of prisons and postals and you know, I'd already done some childhood stuff in, in what we call a, uh, you know, approved schools. I don't know what you call them. Boarders. Proof school, I don't know. Well, we, we called them borstals back then, which was like child prison. Oh, okay. Um, it was complicated. It was, it was, I was considered difficult, but that was, that was many years before. Um, and, uh, yeah, that, they had lock up as well, which was, you know, your key in, key out, which means you can't run freely. Right. Um, but that was, that was, a, that was a short period, but. No, I, I went and I dealt with it. And eventually when I got to jail and the sentence had been squashed, you know, I was out getting a suntan out in the garden doing the growing and then while we were out there, I was counselling the fucking most of the you know the director of the prison because he was an alcoholic I mean they're all alcoholics I mean they I got sick you know ended up doing a year and a half but this fucking guy's got a life sentence you know right. so um so I uh yeah no eventually I, I I've seen mechanics I can't do the mechanic stuff it's, I'm gonna get oil in my hands you know got moved to the kitchen and I was became kitchen boy and then I eventually you know, I was out in the garden, and then of course everyone was smoking weed in prison. So what I did was I planted, started planting seeds all around the entire prison, along the wall right. uh, and the garden, and then eventually in the officers' mess where they had their lunches and stuff. What, what sort of seeds? Like vegetables or? Oh no, marijuana. Oh right. Okay. <laughs> so, where so, did, but, where so, are you but, getting marijuana? Because everyone seeds, was smoking weed, and I had, right. you know, back then they had seeds. You know, yeah, yeah. Before all this new modern weeds that oh, they have. Action. So um yeah, and so I I left there was a it was like a plantation in the other <laughs> time. <laughs> <Nice. laughs> At least you, like like a, you left your mark. Oh I left sent them a postcard afterwards and they were laughing. They were like, you fuck are you <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Yeah, hilarious, hilarious. So I well, then went back to England and then I was like, oh man, what are we gonna do now? You know, I just you know, what am I gonna do now? And then I was in um I was I Actually, I, I'd saved up enough money in prison. I was cutting hair. I was selling eggs, vegetables. God knows what fucking hustles I was doing on the inside. And I saved up actually quite a lot of money. So money's exchanging between prisoners. Yeah. A lot with well, you prison. get you get you get you know, you get you get paid like I think like three dollars a week or two dollars a day for working in the whatever job you had. Wow, well, some hefty no, wages. But was, <laughs> no, but I was cutting hair and moving this and doing. I was I was busting moves. So can people also have extra cash that they've? brought in from the outside world to not, sling you're not around, really though. meant to have it but i had it and i and i hid yeah. it this will come back so we always talk about these stories about you know cutting out books and hiding things you know i yeah. i hid a substantial amount of money i mean you know, a few thousand whatever yeah substantial when you're in the net um inside the book <laughs> and and when i got released eventually and it was this crazy story at the airport they sent these guards out with me and and they couldn't speak English, and I, I was, you know, I was deported. Um, I was actually the only prison that was allowed to stay in Sweden and have what we call um, hemabsak, which means home, home leave, before I left because I wanted to say goodbye to everyone. Mm. And I'd been a good prison. I'd be, I, was, I was teaching English, cutting hair, selling vegetables. I mean, God knows what the fuck I had to do to, to get. Yeah. I didn't want to come out without a penny, you know. And uh, so I came out. I had a chunk of cash, and I uh, had these two guards that. that that took me to the airport, got on the plane. I was handcuffed. I was like, oh, take off the cuffs, you know, Geneva Convention and all of that. So uh, so as soon as they un un uncuffed me, you know, I sort of ran away from them and sat. I didn't want to arrive in England, ha handcuffed to two sure, fucking sure. – and they were in uniform as well. I did, I did, And we didn't have – back. that was before computers and stuff, so they didn't really have, like, you know, the whole sort of, you know um, – what do you call it? Um, in, in, Interpol. I mean, they, they were right. just starting to have some Interpol, but I didn't want to be on record. You know, I didn't want mm. this to ruin my life. You know, I fucked up. I made a mistake. I paid for it. I wanted to be able to. So you knew you still had, had a chance to make a fresh start without that yeah, staining but, but, your Yeah, background. but I didn't want to arrive at Heathrow Airport with two chains sure. chain to two fucking prison guards, you know. So, you know, on the plane, so they're chasing me around the plane. They're moving. They're chasing me around the plane. I'm like, get the fuck away from me. <laughs> Come on, guys. And they didn't speak a word of English, but I spoke Swedish. So, you know, so we arrive in England and they're trying to grab me, and I'm like, we're playing like you know musical 
couple of chairs around the, <laughs> around the line to get to the immigration and customs guys. So the guys come in and and, uh, and they're trying to grab me. And, and I was like, guys, and I sort of do the razzle dazzle and say, like, these cops, you know, they're um they're trying to deliver a prisoner, but they they want to know how they can get back on the plane and get back home to to Sweden really quickly. So I didn't say I was the prisoner. Right. <laughs> I said, so I did this razzle dazzle with them, and 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 then they came and escorted them against their protests back on the line. <laughs> you know, and fucking took them back on the plane. Right. And I was like, yeah, just and the guys were like, well, thanks for the help. You know, nice. yeah, yeah, it was great. Nice. Came in, come into uh, into customs, and it was I think it was at the World Cup time, and people were crazy. And I just, I mean, I'd been you know banged up for a year and a half, and I was completely like a bit nervous around people and yeah, places yeah. and being able to walk somewhere without being locked in and locked out. And um so I get to the to the table and the this amazing Welsh customs guy pulls me over. He goes, hey yeah, you know, come on over, you know, let's let's take a look in your act, shall we? So okay, let's have a look. So first thing he went to was my books and opened up the book right there where all the money was. <laughs> so he's like, well why are you carrying so much cash out oh, Hidden in a book. Fuck, <laughs> hidden in a book, you know. He's like, okay, so we just put that on the side. And then he fucking dug Did a... he take it? Did he... No, no, he put oh, it on the side. He... Okay. And he dug around and he pulls out the bottom of my bag a piece of hash of about, oh, no. of about four grams. I don't know how the fuck they never found it. This bag has been in the prison with me. Oh, you know, no. like one of those. But that's, like, that's the one you were actually inducted with. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. They, when I packed the clothes they in, together, they grabbed oh. a bag with my clothes in. I, I, I just there was a piece of hash there. So he Didn't picked it up and goes, well, 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 what's this? I was like, I, I got no idea. He goes, well, it's not rabbit shit, is it? It looks like ash to me. I, I looked at it, I started crying. I was, like, wow. I was so fucking broken at that point. Oh, like, my God. The thought of being yeah, can you imagine? And he was like, I was like, oh, here we go. I'm going, I'm going to come out. He'll go straight back to fucking prison. Because oh. it, it was serious to have drugs or hash. Oh, and they yeah. arrest you, you know? Yeah. So anyway, the guy fucking just flicked it in the toilet. He goes, tell me where you've been. Oh, I, said, I said, I just got out of jail. He goes, how old are you? I go, I'm fucking, I just turned 20. You know, and he, was, and he just, you know what the guy did? He gave me a hug. Oh, wow. Yeah, he fucking gave me a hug. He goes, welcome home. And uh, he goes, it's your first time in prison? I was like, yep. And, and he goes, the last? I'm like, yep. And he goes, good, don't fuck up your life. No, get out of here. Oh, what a legend. A legend. Those are the moments. Legend. I mean, the oh. reason you remember that so well. Oh, I... Like, I remember his eyes. I remember yeah. his uniform. And, you know, because customs in, guys in England aren't necessarily that. He was an old school Welsh guy, tough guy. And I was just looked at him and I was just like, oh, man, don't do this to me, please. He goes, go on, don't fuck up. This is your start of your new life. No, and you really need those, even up. with a brief encounter like that, you need that reminder that there are good adults exactly. around at that age, that, exactly. you know, authority is not always going to hurt you. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It was just, it was like, you know what, I just walked, I mean, I, I wasn't walking, I was floating out that fucking door of Heathrow and it was the World Cup and I got on a bus and went back home and then I pulled my mum aside and I was like, mum, you know, i got to tell you something, you know, I haven't been on a... Hippie commune for a year and a half. I've been in jail. Wow. Do you know, darling, are you okay? Just out, out, so out of touch here. Right. So, you know, darling, are you okay? What's, anyway, would you like tea? <laughs> I was, oh, fuck me. Okay. <laughs> yes, mum. And uh, and that was that. And then um, and then shortly after that, or uh, well, shortly after that, I started, I was, you know, I, I actually went out and bought a Jaguar I, with the money. I bought a Jag XJ6, <laughs> powder blue XJ6, driving around bright. And I was getting St straight for something that doesn't increase in value within a week. <laughs> well, I, you know, I only had a couple of grand. I couldn't yeah. buy a new one. Sure, but uh, that's why I bought the old one because they were cheap. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Same with the Rollers. I actually bought a Rolls Royce after that as well, but and a Porsche. But um, uh, yeah, I started. You know, I was at a Target and bright, and I was getting pulled over every five minutes and. You know, I was a face in Brighton. So um, so I just like, you know, this is continuing. Then I was getting stopped for speeding. One what day, sort of work did you slip into? Like what did I, you... I was started selling insurance for um door to door insurance, which is the probably the worst job ever on the planet. The toughest, most miserable. Door to door is just brutal, isn't door -to -door it? Door to door is brutal. Yeah. And uh, and I you know, but I had the jag, so I was didn't feel like a complete loser. I had a so people at least trusted you that you were making good cash as you rocked yeah, up. Yeah, but it was doors. a hustle, you know. It was just yeah. like it was just like, no, not today, slam, you know, I'm not used to getting slammed doors yeah. on my faces. Um so and then and then um and then you know the temptation was there to start slipping back into trouble, and there was God knows how much so much villainy going on in Brighton. I mean they they say Brighton's full of you know queer, it's such queer, a, queer um, peers and racketeers. You know it must have felt like such a bizarre U-turn because that that flight to California, the initial one to go and meet Tony, was just you probably felt like this is it. I'm never going back. You exactly. Know, I thought, but it was you know it was like you know, you know the circus to. You know the next one, the skating. Mm. Now, but you know, like it's, these are all chapters yeah, you know, of which, yeah. you know, of which, and still so young. incredibly high. Um, and then the fall was pretty brutal mm. after each one. 
But you've got to pick yourself up. You've got to shake yourself off. You can't give up. Did you ever hit the kind of mental depressive lows that that involved, you know, thinking you'd tap out at all or did you always have that that, vigour to keep going? No, that came later. No, I'll never give up. That's that's one thing. So there was was always a real just determined spirit. We're only halfway through the fucking story, so we've got a lot more to go. Um, At that point, you know, no, I I never give up. I'm an animal. I I just, you know, no is not an option. So there's a driving force. Later on, you know, in New York when when the drugs started to get out of control and it's doing way too much blow, Mm. which is cocaine for you people who don't know what blow is, you know, because it was everywhere. It was in the club, isn't it? Of course, that affects your mood and your serotonin and, and there's been a couple of nights you know where i've definitely sat there just oh fuck man you know this is mm. just enough you know i've had it so what, what next took you to i mean how how long was the gap from there to getting back to the states so uh so so i you was know, so back in bright the insurance the, you know, i could see the villainy i could see where it was going one i was i'm in a toilet store one night and what had happened is all the all the sort of South London, uh, not South London, but all the, all the a lot of the villains from you know, leftovers from the Cray brothers and you know the Adams families and all those gangsters and South London. They started to make a lot of money. They came down to Brighton. And they were starting to buy these you know, big beautiful houses on the best streets on, on a place called Dyke Road and uh, in Brighton. And and they were moving in next to the old aristocracy in Brighton. So you had the villains and the and the toffs living next to each other. Wow. You know, which was you know quite unusual in mm. Brighton. So. Um, you know, Brighton's a pretty eclectic place. You know, it's full of incredible characters and villains and wonder. It's just got everything. You know, it's a, it's 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 a movie. The whole town's a movie. But um, it started to get rough, and there was a club we all used to go to, and one of the villains who was particularly violent. Um, you know, I was in a toilet stall, <laughs> doing a bump or something, with one guy, and he bashed in the door and pulled out a gun and stuck it in the guy's mouth and was was going to blast the guy um, and I begged him not to. Um, he was that crazy because he did kill people later on in life. Did you know the guy that he was threatening? Or? Yeah, no, they were both my friends. You know, the oh, the villain were. was my friend and I was just like, this was this started to happen on a regular basis. Mm. You know, they were they were in conflict with, with each other and, you know, the, the villains were sort of making a move to sort of take over things. And I was just like, if I stay in this town, I'm going back to jail and I'm never going back to jail. Mm. And I went on, I was on holiday. Actually, no, with my Porsche. That's so why I had a Porsche. And I kept getting stopped by the cops, and I was like, eventually, I lost my license. And um, and it was a left-hand drive Porsche. Uh, you know the difference over in mm-hmm. England. We have the steering wheel on the yeah. other. It was not perfect for England, but it was perfect for America. The dollar was at some crazy rate against the pound. So I said, I went to uh, went to, uh, to to Greece to Mykonos with, with a with a crew from Brighton. Another fucking movie. This story. <laughs> Got to Mykonos, and you know we, what took you there? What which, it was a holiday. Group? It was just a vacation. Okay. It was about I took a you know a gang of us from Brighton, and we ran and I ran into a, a gang of guys or group of guys, great guys from New York City. Okay, and they were young and good looking, and you know razzle and dazzle. And we actually were we were all sort of you know making a play for the, this group of Swedish girls and who ran off with you know the Italians you and left away from Sweden, can, can you? Cannot man, <laughs> they're, they're, those blondies they're so cute. And um, and so we ended up us, and then. So we started to make friends, and then uh, and then there was these crazy sort of Indian, like not Indian, uh, not, not South Asian Indian, like South American Indian right, right. guys, and we see two of them, and they're this, and then there's all these other characters around them in the fucking bushes or in the you know in the, in the in the shadows, and they've all got their hands. Sounds like an LSD trip. Well, you know, it was <laughs> it's well, you know. So we started making friends, and we started well, you know, started making friends with them because you know we were quite charismatic, all of us together. Sure. You've got the New Yorkers, you've got the these Brighton boys, all good looking boys. You know, Except me, I was, I was the token gesture there. And uh, but I, I had the rap, so I was talking. Hey, what's your name? Oh, Carlos or whatever. I said, oh, you know, yeah. where, are you, where are you from? Oh, Medellin. So I'm oh, Medellin, Colombia. I said, you don't have any coat, do you? <laughs> she was like, actually, I do. <laughs> he pulls out. I can't a, imagine someone from there not having. Pulls out a fucking rock of like you know, an ounce of blow. Did you help yourself? Nice. I, myself. I was in the toilet, chiseling away, <laughs> stuffing it away for later. The guy came back with two grams and he laughed. You know? <laughs> and it was, yeah, it was, that was crazy. That's when. when Cocaine was fucking good. <laughs> sure. Uh, you know, ether washed and all the rest of it. Anyway, so we got talking and it ended up this guy was like Pablo Escobar's number two. <laughs> and all the Indians around like, really him. really was? Oh, no, for real, for real, for real. He was like a major fucking Colombian yeah, guy. Yeah, because you wouldn't want to claim that title. <laughs> no, he was on holiday, but, so, he had, but he had all these, but when, when he looked around, he had like 12 guys around him like, with fucking machine guns under their chest. Oh, chat. so they were literally They were the body, him. exactly. Oh, they, wow. They were the okay. body guy. So we made friends and it was great. And, I mean, the Americans made friends and, you know, I became quite close with this guy actually, um, and uh, he, said, he got, you know, he goes, 
you know, where are you going? I go on back, back to Brighton, England, because I'll be in England in a few weeks. You know, let me know if you need anything. If I need anything, well, you give me a, give me a fucking couple of, a couple of kilos of that. <laughs> I'll be rich in fucking six months. And of course, you know, when I got back to England and started to look at the potential, it was like, whatever you want. Like, wow. You know, like whatever you need, you know. So like, that's like, um, what a swing from, I've got to get out of here because I can't go back yeah, to Yeah, but jail. this was too good to be true. That, you know, that's this just, was, yeah, someone's I'm, just literally I'm, opening I'm, the golden doorway. It's like, you know, considering the crap they were snorting in Brighton back then, I mean, this was just like, I'd be a millionaire in sure. six months, you know. And I had the connection, with, and we were close as well. Was, mm. yeah, the guy was giving me, I mean, anyway. So, um, so yeah, and everyone was like lit up like Christmas trees for the whole trip. In, 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 uh, in uh, this is before, you know, you know I, I'm, I'm joking about the drugs, and I'm, I'm going to address it because it's been a you know a sort of Achilles heel of mine for. I've been a sort of functional, you know, in clubs are full of drinking and, and, sure, uh, and yeah. models and drugs. And, um, you know, I've sort of been a, an extre extremely disciplined, functional party guy for most of my life. But I always get up in the morning. Well, if I haven't slept, I get up and do my day's work from six in the morning till, you know, four in the morning and sleep two hours and go back and do it again. Yeah. I'm extremely determined. And um, and I didn't. And when you're young, you know, you, you know you're still kind of in shape and you look good. And you don't even have to you, think about that. You don't have to. But, to but, but eventually it catches up. So, you know, I mean, I fucking hate the drug now. And I've, mm. and I've been sober for like 11 years. So I would strongly strongly advise to stay away from it i've learned my lesson it, it just, yeah it's, it's an interesting you know. one though like the in those younger years it's so hard to convince anyone to take that good advice but you know, it's we, so we didn't to, take it did we, we didn't take we it, didn't no. take it. But, so but, but, but cocaine is a very sinister drug it's not like you know smack or or, or, or you know meth yeah, or where, I mean, where, where you can see physically very quickly the effect it has on you coke creeps up on you before you know it you lost your mind you lost mm. your friends you lost your wife you've lost all your money you spent all your money's on fucking hookers and nonsense and you know, God knows what, and um, and you're not functioning well. Mm. Um, that's you know, and then you start smoking the stuff, and then it gets really sinister. I mean, re that, yeah, those that level of abuse starts to rewire your brain it's and your whole oh, it attitude it, it to life. Ruins your life. You know, you become a paranoid gimp sitting in the mm. corner when you do the stuff. So, anyway, so I'm I'm pretty anti drugs these days. So yeah, sure. So that. That particular moment was a, another big turning point for how you decided to. Yeah, no, I just went. I went. I could see the potential, and and uh, you know, I had I had one moment where I I sort of been tempted to maybe you know well, maybe I can take a bit of this and give it to this one, and I was just like, what the fuck are you doing? Actually, I rolled my. I, oh, so you did pull yourself up? I, yeah, well, I had a Porsche, and I you know I was driving back from London one day, and I rolled, smashed it. I was I think I was trying to do a bump while I was driving. I rolled the car and hit a cow, oh, and, and I had to sort of leg it with a bag of God knows what across the, the Sussex hills with cops chasing me. And I was like, what the fuck are you doing, you idiot? Come on, get out of here. So I got the car fixed, shipped the car to America, and arrived in, you know, the boys are like, you know, come come stay with us and blah, blah. And the same guys. Yeah, the, the group yeah. from Mykonos. So, yeah. uh, so I get to America, and, yeah, we pulled up at, you know, at the airport, and I've got, I think I've got like, you know, Couple of hundred pounds on me, like three hundred bucks, and the immigration guys go, "Well, you know, how much? You know, how long you stand? How much you got?" And I said, "Well, I got three hundred pounds. I want to stay for you know, how long? Can I stay? Six months?" <laughs> He's like, "Get the fuck out of here! <laughs> You're going back now." And I'm like, "No, oh, really? Yeah, yeah." No. He was like, "Dude, you got a return ticket?" I got no. Um, right, right. How yeah, much yeah. money you got? Nothing. What are you going to do? And I said, "Well, I've got a Porsche here." And he's sort of eyed me up and down and goes, get the, yeah, right. <laughs> so I said, no, come outside. I've got a, I've got a beautiful Porsche. It's worth like you know, 30, 40 grand sitting. Right. My friend is at the door. He goes, I don't So you had already sent it. Yeah, it's already ahead. gone. So it was with one of the boys. Right. So we went outside and the cop, uh, the, the immigration guy, uh, looked at him and was like, fuck me, you're telling the truth. Wow. Well, sort of so thing. He, he goes, welcome to America. He goes, I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure you're going to do really well. You've done all right with the immigration guys. Um, <laughs> yeah, these, these two, not the rest yeah. of them. And, um, yeah, so, I, so we, I've got the port. I'm like, yeah, fucking coming from New Jersey airport up to a viewpoint overlooking Manhattan. I don't know if you've, anyone, for anyone who's ever looked at New York City at nighttime it's from across the river, like, Holy fuck! It's a magic moment. That's not. That's. I not. was born in New York City. Oh, you were born and, in it. Uh, really? yeah, Where? Yeah, born in Manhattan. Manhattan. Yeah, and uh, it took me a lifetime to sort of get back there, but I, oh, wow. I'm back there each year now. God, amazing. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that where it's gone. You know, in a little bit. Sure. But yeah, but I, I do understand the magic. You know, I just stood on that hillside. Scribing. I'm from. You know, I'm, again, you know, I've escaped another potentially 
awful fucking future mm. in Brighton and I'm now standing on a cliff looking at this city sparkle and rumble. I love it. It's uh, on the other coast. Too, the you know, one was the West Coast. This is the East Coast. It was just fucking, it was just like, holy fuck. So we zoomed into town and they're all like, well, we want to go to this hot new club called, you know, Area, which is a new club. Just after Studio 54 and Xenon had finished. It was like, you know, 62, 72, 67, 82, 83, 83, 83, somewhere around there. Disco era kicking in. Yeah, well, yeah, Xenon, you know, 54. Area was like this new fucking downtown club that was just like super crazy. Um, they changed the interior every six, you know, every six weeks and every celebrity on the planet was there. It was like the toughest door on the planet to get into. Right. So we get down, there's like 500 guys outside, 500 people outside screaming, yeah, me, me, me. And I look up at the door. This is my first night in Manhattan. And um, and I looked up at the door, and, and there was this guy called Jules Gayton, who was an old skateboarder friend of mine, who was working. The, he was the he was the door guy. Like he had like a whole bunch of security around. Him. He's the guy picking the people out. Of, like you, oh, you, you. Oh, what are the chances? I fucking looked at this dude. I was like, Yay! and uh, and he was like, oh my god, it's Mark. And then he sent you know all those guys out, and I had like ten people with me. You know, and he, and the people that were you were with are your guys from Mykonos uh, at yeah, that time, yeah, exactly. And, so and, they're, and they're their already getting impressed by who you know on the door. Like, oh yeah. Oh yeah, no, no, they we, must have no, thought no, that was pretty cool. No, we just breezed the whole fucking like like five hundred people. It was like Moses coming through. Wow, and, they uh, thought they were taking you out for a night just, in the town. Exactly, you're exactly. like, nah, follow me, boys. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, so, 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 Jules Gaten was like, hey, we hugged it out and you know, blah blah blah. And yeah, then there was you know, boy George was there and you know, this one and that one and everyone was. They'd, they'd, I'd never seen unisex toilets before. Everyone was just fucking doing blow everywhere. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is it. I'm never leaving this town. <laughs> this is me. Every yeah. black sheep on the planet in one fucking one yeah. on one island. I'm in the Mark Baker Collective yeah. Agency. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I did that, and then you know that was it. And I said, I'm not leaving. So I stayed, and then I started well, importing cars. And can I ask if there was an element to that? Um, involving music for you? Were you, did you, because like clearly the, you know, there's something the tribal about like your people and your your kind uh, of situation. Just, was, but was there was, a music element that you got, yeah, well, that you loved about the clubs or? Well, yeah, because, but no, but at that point, you know, it was, I mean, it was, we were seven days, seven nights. We never stopped. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, you know, we were partying and drinking and, but it, you know, New York City, you, you had like, you know, in one night you would go to like 10 or 10 or 12 different 15 places starting stopped. at seven o'clock, seven, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11, next spot. Next, and it was all, only a cab ride away. Mm. And of course, you know, another bump, next spot, another bump, next spot. And yeah. then, um, so I was going up to like six, seven in the morning. I go home. So this went on for a while, but then I had to, to, to actually work. And that's when I started delivering furniture. Well, no, I was, that's why no, I was okay. selling cars. I was, I was importing cars. I had Rolls Royces, Ferraris, Porsches, mostly Porsches. But, you know, I mean, half the time we didn't have any money to pay for the gas. Right. <laughs> and then my partner smashed up all the cars and we lost all the money and I was back to square one. God damn. Again, back to zero in New York. And I thought, well, fuck, what am I going to do now? Um, you know, a recurring theme. <laughs> so you hadn't gotten involved in an anything too dodgy with those guys no 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 not at all no that was yeah. like, these guys were sweet kids you know mm. even though two of them are dead now um from from other things um and then uh and then so then another friend of ours started this company selling furniture and i was like well you know i'll go deliver furniture fuck me i'll do that but i still had the rolls voice you know and i didn't, didn't have much money but you know i was getting by and um, and then uh, started delivering the furniture to the Bronx and this neighborhood and that neighborhood. And that's how I got, you know, I, I did that for like a year and a half, two years. And then the company grew and grew and grew. And then they started to sell jewelry and this and that. That's when I started repairing. And that, those, were, right, that, yeah. that, those were Russians. And that's when you found yourself suddenly going into places and being the, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> the, being that The guy. project's dead being collector. That guy. <laughs> wow. And then, um, but at the same time then, um, I, it was just started to get crazy. And there was just, I was like, I'm going to end up getting shot here. It was not by, you know, shoot out between them you know i mean i've like yeah you, you go walk into a place with like 20 30 crips or bloods on the door of a project and you're the only white guy within, I can't even, I can't within imagine. and they're just looking at you and they're just like we got uh, do we pop this fucking guy now or do we just or is he a cop did your uh, accent save you oh absolutely absolutely yeah. absolute, absolute. i, I imagine like, oh hello guys all right mate you're right yeah like, the f they just didn't know what to Especially make of back us. then i mean they didn't know what to make of us and uh but you know, but we had radios and handcuffs, and, and I was carrying a gun. You know, so it was, it was, you know. But I, I yeah, I had to cheek, cheeky my way out of it so mm. many times, and 
And uh, and then of course after a while I got to know a lot of these guys and you know and, and some of them of course blew up you know in the in the, in the rap rap world and I you know I know them from way back when you know mm. and I I just knew the neighborhoods and the feel anyway blah blah and then um so then I started like working that during the daytime and at nighttime I started working at this I was going to this place it was the hottest place in Manhattan called Cafe Pacifico um, dear Gloria Demand bless her Larry Demand her husband. Her boys, Drew Demand and Todd, who eventually became a partner, his lovely wife. Do you want uh, Rose. beer, by the way? Yeah, listen, well, no, I'll go, I'm good. Let me know and I'll duck oh. out and grab more for you. There's oh. some in the fridge out there. Yeah. I'll, should, should we put on hold then? I'll just. Can I'll we have a piss break? I'll, I'll let, yeah, 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 break yeah. Well. take a piss break. Uh, so where were we? <laughs> so we're in, we're in New York. We're in New York. Oh. We're doing collections. We're getting our collections. Okay, so there's this great place we're going to called. Cool. Yeah. We're on. The, we're good. Cafe Pacifico. It was just. Crazy wild place in the early eighties. You know, Bruce Willis was a bartender. This one, oh, yeah? one, yeah. Everyone in New York, every celebrity in New York has been a, a waiter or oh, a, wait <laughs> a waitress at some point. You know, absolutely. So, so, um, so I'd go in there, you know, and I used to pull up, you know, with with my friends. And I had the Rolls Royce park out, so it was a big scene outside this place. And uh, and I'd get the best table, and you know, they didn't have bottles then, but they had, you know, these frozen pink margarita things. Anyway, blah blah, and um. Long story. I eventually came back to her. And I said, Gloria. I said, you know, I need a, I need a job. <laughs> She's like, no worries, honey. <laughs> no worries. What do you need a job? I'm like, yeah, give me a job. So anyway, I started working as a waiter. Yeah, you, know, you know, every celebrity, you know, Mick Jagger was coming in. This one, that one. Everyone was coming to Cafe Pacifico, and I, and I put on all these different sort of personas every time I went to a table. I mean, I'd be Fritz Zavetta or, or Francois from Paris. Or, you know, I have to make up all these characters sure. just, just to make it fun. You know, was, I've done a lot of hospitality <laughs> years and I know exactly, you know, one of my best mates I met in hospitality and we were those guys. Yeah. It's, I was having some yeah, fucking you've fun. You've got to have fun. <laughs> got to have fun. Anyway, so long story short, him, then the, you know, the, I became manager and then I took over. And the owner's son and Todd, we opened up I, I, at the same time. I was going out all the time, and all the the whole supermodel phenomena had just started in New York. Um, you know, Naomi, Christy, Linda, Helmut Fierce, and blah blah blah. And 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 all my Swedish girlfriends and friends from Europe, they were all coming into town. And and you know, we were just right place, right time. You know, it went from you know the rock stars being celebrities to the celebrities being celebrities, and then it was the supermodels that became the celebrities. You know, George Michael and Faith and, and Terry. I think it was Terry Muglo. Yeah, there was, was that time there, wasn't there, where just suddenly it's, models it's, just and, became. And it was, and that was, I was bang because because my friends was that whole right. you know, Ford models click. Models, this and that, they were all my friends. So when I opened up my first place and I started doing promotions. So what was that jump like from, from, because for a lot of people that work in hospitality, they never open okay, up. Their I'll, own I'll tell you the jump. <laughs> the jump was this, and it's the lesson I've learned for the rest of my life was this. So I knew everyone, kiss, kiss, hello, uptown, downtown. I was, I never stopped. I was mm. all I had, you know, I had the cops driving me downtown and sirens on if I was late for a party, you know, I'd really? be friends with everybody. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. that's how many years in? This is now we're talking 90, 1991. And you're what, 26 or something? Uh, 27? Uh, 67, 82, 20, 20, 27. Yep. Yeah, something like that. I'm starting to make a name for myself. I knew everybody, adored. I mean, I'd was, I was I be go till five, six, seven in the morning, can't sleep a couple of hours and then go back Nothing out. Nothing else matters at that age too. When you, you can, And you've got the resilience. Like that. Exactly, you've got the resilience yeah. to do it. So. And it wasn't showing yet. I was still running every day yeah. and I was I was pretty fit. I had an Irish set of Thor or dogs. I had dogs all my whole life. But then... um. Then, uh, blah, 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 blah. so then I said, like, You know what? I'm so fucking good. I know so many people. <laughs> I'm going to throw a party. Right. So I spoke to one of Mick Jagger's guys. It was actually, uh, it was Woody's. It was Woody. uh, what's his face? Woody. Uh, Ronnie Wood. Woody. Ronnie Wood had a club down on the Lower East Side. All right. And he was, I was like, Ronnie, can I do a party at your club? You know, Woody's. Like, yeah, sure, mate. He goes, Speak to my manager. I suppose the manager goes, Well, we've got Monday night open. So it was Monday night in January. I think I know so many people. Everyone's going to come. To my party, so I put out flyers. And I was like, you know what? I don't think there's enough security. We need more security and more barriers. And I think just shut the fucking block down because there's going to be two thousand people showing up to this party. Because I know that many people. Well, the night of the party, it was a bit rainy. It's like three people showed up. Oh no! <laughs> I can tell you, I've, <laughs> what I've, been, a moment. I've been in jail. What? I've been shot. <laughs> I've been stabbed. <laughs> I've been pistol whipped. I've been fucking hung upside down out of buildings. And I've dangled people. I in my life I've never felt this bad. So I hid under the DJ booth <laughs> while you know, these one or two people kept coming in and just seeing an empty room. 
and I fucking died. I could have crawled into a matchbox and just never come out. I, I wow. just, it was the worst, worst. I think the only thing people, you know, uh, and this leads into the business of party promotion and being, yeah. a, of being a promoter, which eventually I became. Um, I, I, I just, you know, most people fall apart when they do a dinner party at home. You know, the level of stress of people, you know, when you invite people to your home, yeah, it's got to be yeah. right. It's, the well, person I, putting on the party often doesn't have a very good time. They're so, or or oh, connect with anyone miserable. for long enough. So, it's it's so, running so, so multiply that by like a thousand yeah. and do that every fucking night in life. Mm. You know, that was that was my life. So so when no one showed up and I was just like, oh, God, I'm just going to leave New York now. I can't show my face to anyone. But then I was like, well, if they didn't come, they didn't know it was empty and Maybe right, a few yeah. or so. Maybe I can do some off, some control damage. Just Photoshop those three people well, a I thousand was, times. You, you missed my party. <laughs> anyway, I didn't go back there. <laughs> so, but at that point, which was an absolute defining point in my promotional career, of which I, without you know being realistic, I think I was probably one of five guys that started the the, the modern business of promotion, which is what you see now in the millions around the world. Because I, I started to do things and the teams that we had and promotional teams and promoters and God knows what that we did to fill our nightclubs and, you know, the invitations and this and that. Because there wasn't, we created a business. Hmm. Before it was just the clubs open and people came to the club. You know, Steve Rebell and those guys. But you didn't have people promoting different venues and different clubs. Well, I started that business. I had to I had to invent something because Did that come off the back of having no one show up to your party? You, you, well, yeah, you it, was, sort of... it was it was yeah, I went back to the drawing board and I thought, you know what? If you're going to do a party, I always equate it to a to a a, a pizza. You got to you got to have the right mix sixteen of pieces of the pizza. You've only got half a pizza. You've got mm. half a pizza. So you've got to have the venue, the location, right. the date, the music, the promotion, the marketing. You've got to have the whole fucking thing. Mm -hmm. And I just said, I'm never ever in my life ever going to feel like that again. Right. Ever. It's just not worth it. Have so, you felt like that again? Never. Well, no, okay. never. No, I, the next part I did, 2,000 people showed up. Oh, I did. So I put together, you know, the next one I did, I rethought it, the venue. I put a team together to help me do it. Yeah. Couldn't be just me. Um, and so it's just that real, that sort of probably I, a slap I fucked up. I got too, I got too confident. Got I got too, I got cocky, too just, cocky. You fuck. thought just your personal and I knowledge of people. Bit, and I got bit slapped down. <laughs> <laughs> we all need it though, right? Yeah. Cause yeah. I never, I never made that mistake again. Cause yeah. I never want to be, I never want to feel or never wanted to feel like that ever yeah. again, where you invite people. Cause it's not just, you know, come to my party. It's, it's not about the money. It was, it's self worth oh, yeah, it's and your popularity. And am I like, do they like me? And yeah. you know, that brought all kinds of fucking, especially when you're Demons out of my childhood. You bring to a point <laughs> yourself to a point of that kind of confident. I'm set. I know, and then no one shows up. I mean, no two people. <laughs> oh yeah, that is a harsh, so, uh, harsh. Slap. So yeah, so I went back to the drawing board, did it, and then we did it again, and, and then I put a, a team together in New York, and we were. And then I was like, well, fucking, you know, let's do crazy play. Let's do aircraft carriers and. Dungeons on the Lower East Side and right, so boats it was like and, going into just wild oh, territory. Our, our parties were absolutely, absolutely legendary. I mean, you know, we three, four, five thousand people and this and that. And then, then, then I start, I opened up my first club, you know, mm. Metro CC, and then I opened up the original Buddha Bar. Um, I'd been I was working with Peter Gation. So Buddha Bar was your the original Buddha Bar was mine. The original Buddha Bar was yeah. it your your creation? Your yeah, well, that's what you Jack, Jack Nicholson <laughs> came up with the name. Really? <laughs> yeah, Jack. Give, tell me about that. We were sitting around. When I, was, I had a, I had one, a place called Flowers, which my friend Johnny Calvani had named. Um, that was that was on Seventeenth Street. Yeah, John F. Kennedy. Hell, I mean, the, I mean, you know, there was. It was insane, legendary. Right. Um, you know, and Jack Nicholson was a was supermodel. A central. Or yeah, well, Jack was good friends with Johnny Carvani and another friend of ours called Alan Finkelstein. And we were sitting around and go, what do you want to call it? He goes, well, let's call it the Buddha Bar. <laughs> so Jack, <laughs> Where did he come? Jack, you could have called it Dog Shit Central if I'd still call it that because you fucking named I it. I eat breakfast. <laughs> that guy Jack. 400 yards. What a fucking, God bless him. <laughs> so you know, my hero. Where, did he just pull that out of his ass? He or? just pulled it out of his fucking you know, Right. Just, just and, you know, and then... Yeah, it was, but it made sense at that time because everyone was getting all spiritual. So it was called the Buddha Bar, you know. Yeah, it's called the Buddha Bar, and then you know, we'll just fucking have fifty golden Buddhas up on the wall and make it Chinese style. And these absolute geniuses, Eric Good and Serge Becker, who now you know own the Mercer and God knows what. I mean, they owned the area as well. They were so I just started to learn like you can't do it on your own. You've got to have, you you got to have a team. Was the Buddha Bar um, music collections? No, was well, what, well, <laughs> is that separate? I'm not going to start ragging on the French, but I'm going to rag on the French. Right, okay. <laughs> they can't help themselves. <laughs> <laughs> so I had the Buddha Bar, and it was like, yeah, you know, Madonna was there, and Naomi, and 
Kate Moss. It was abs- for one year you know, on Varick and Van Damme, man, it was absolutely the hottest place on the planet. You couldn't you couldn't get on the block alone in the fucking place. What a transition from a party with yeah. No well, I just started, we started to grow, and then I you know, had this massive loft on Thirteenth Street, and I was doing after hours with you know Bobby De Niro and everyone you've ever heard of was in my club or at my house. Mm. Pretty much every night of the week, you know, it was nuts because we had the girls. I'm sorry, we had it was all about everyone was following the models, and, sure. uh, but we had fun and we were crazy and we did these great parties. And Oliver Stone, you know, became a you know, he's my uncle, <laughs> really. Wow, I'm very close with Oliver, yeah, I love him. Um, still, still in contact today, still in contact, yeah, yeah, you know, he's a, he's a little older, so am I, you know, my life has changed now, but but yeah, so we had we just had this, we were ground zero, that's it. We had the best clubs, we had all the top girls, we had all the celebs, and then we started traveling around the world, throwing parties and just it just it just it was just this non-stop fucking circus of excess and and uh, but we worked we worked really hard yeah i mean you'd have to oh. that, it's behind the scenes with stuff like that you've brutal. got to be working your ass off to yeah, keep but, things going and keep well, things it's brutal moving, when you haven't only sleep for two days you know and in you the production world jump on a jet and fly here and do a you know whatever you've got you know just to stay awake you know mm. so it just it, but then it became abusive you know and uh you know, again i know we're on a time constraint here and you know you're gonna I'll try and bring it to a point, but we had we got we had clubs, we had restaurants, we had you know events around the world. One more outrageous than the last one, um, but you know, it started to take its toll. And then there was a new generation. Of, so we started this business of promotion. We started bottle service, you know, bottle service. And I says, oh, bottles. I, I tell you how bottle service started at the tunnel, upstairs in the green room. So at that point, there'd not been the concept of a bottle no, on your table. No, God, no, no, no. In Paris, they'd done it at, at Le Bandouche wow. and Hubert Bukowski, God rest in, you know, rest in peace, Hubert. They kind of had it, and, and I, and me and Jeffrey, my partner, had seen it. But, but in New York, they had it, and I just saw this fucking poor waitress every night. She was trying to get through this sloppy, cracked out crowd of beautiful people, but, but she was, she every, kept getting all the the tray full of drinks kept knocking on the floor. Right. I was, well, why don't you just make the drinks at the table? Just bring a bottle. And then, of course, they lapped that up. We had a bottle of champagne and six glass, <laughs> and they were like, you know, royalty. So everyone starts, oh, we want that. Well, well then we started like. People are so attracted to that, too. It's well, such a thing. We started now. monetizing the real estate. So, mm. so we, I was like, well, why don't we just, if you're going to have a table, you can have a table if you buy two bottles. Right, yeah. But I was like, two bottles. That's it. Come on, you can't take the piss and take it. Well, that, of course, eventually became, you know, you've got to spend 50000 for a table, wow. of which, you know, most of the world hated, hated you know, the people who. And that obviously that. just makes but, it ex- but, so but they exclusive. Just, I mean, you know, at Lotus, own. you know, we had, you know, eight guys show up. I mean, it was like 2,000 people outside the door, 1,000 mm. people every night, and you couldn't get in for whatever. You know, and same with Budabar, but you couldn't get in, you know. And, and for us, it was always about the look and the beauty. I mean, we were, we were turning, you know, we were turning people away. Like uh, people that, you know, you, you recognize now as celebrities, we were like, you're not a celebrity. You know, you you can't come in because we just don't want to read about it tomorrow on page six of the New York Post that you were at the club because we've got real celebrities here and you're not right. a real celebrity. Of course, with a, you know, the whole explosion of, you know, online sort of, you know, uh, entertainment tonight and TMZ and all the rest of it. So like they made celebrities out of no one because they need the content. Well, mm. we didn't want any of it. We had legitimate celebrities, you know, whether it was, you know, but it was any one of them, King Puffy and J-Lo and mm-hmm. yeah, every, every fucking one. They were in the club every night of the week. And, um, and, uh, and you know, and, and, you know, if you showed up at the door and you said, yeah, well, I'm going to spend $10,000, well, we can't come in. We don't care about that. The next generation who we had promoting our clubs for us, you know, they'd been business, you know, they'd been, they'd been educated properly. I mean, we hadn't been, we were just party people who mm. made a business out of partying. Streetwise. Yeah, streetwise. Streetwise, but not education smart, you know. Mm. Um, and, but these kids made, you know, they did really good. Um, and I just saw the time, you know, eventually when I sort of, you know, I had a, what am I going to have another hot club and do another party in Paris or another fucking jet and another Ferrari. Did you, that. did you quite quickly feel your, like no, well, at it, that point, feel your own, like just physical. Oh, I was, yeah, no, I, it was just, it just wasn't fun anymore. It wasn't challenging. Them. It wasn't, I mean, you know, it became a stuck record. And I, was I mean, just, this is the thing, no matter how exciting and incredible and vibrant. You're going to get bored of it. You, you know. do, don't you? Like once you know it, in, I think the, the trick is, is the moment it becomes predictable is the moment that exactly. you just go, I just need exactly. something new now. Well, some people like that predictability. Characters like us probably don't, you know, I, yeah. I, I want a new challenge and I, and I want to feel like I'm achieving something and, you know, just, you know, doing that kiss, kiss, love, love, hang, hang, bang, bang, you know, sniff, sniff, you know, mm. every fucking night it just became monotonous. And then eventually my girlfriend, I'd already, you know, separated with, with my incredibly amazing, wonderful 
you know, young young supermodel wife who just had enough. She's like, Mark, I can't do this anymore. I love you, but I'm out. And that that was you know that, that was a, a, that was a big hit. And everything you love starts. Oh, it's just well, because that's like a full. That's your base. It's because right? you're working. Oh. You know, I'm mm. working. I'm doing my best. I'm providing a lifestyle which you bought into. Mm. You know, you knew you. But I, it's I don't a think classic you, story. You don't right? think you quite know how how tough it was, and you know it's good for six months, but normal people don't live like that you know mm. we this just went on for month after year after year and all the promises of you know quiet dinners together and yeah, no matter right, yeah, the fuck yeah. off it was like 50 people joining us mm -hmm. so but i had to keep going because i had a machine that would you know that security factor of you know having the security of having that big chunk of chunk of change under the bed mm. <laughs> or whatever we hid on um or, were you or stockpiling bank. any any life savings yeah, yeah it was but then i started piling to one and then you know you just become frivolous and yeah. at what point was there a point where there was a danger zone where you were oh, so over the top with partying that you were no i'd always get up and work in the morning but i came you know i, I was having a i was having a, a rape at my, at my loft uh and you know most people yeah, it was crazy. I had this crazy You're party. You're having a what? <laughs> You're going to draw that out of it. I'm not going to say. We were having a party, and yeah. it was a pretty wild party, and lots of people were getting, you know, jumping up and down and dancing and getting naked and all the rest of it. And then right. uh, my my girlfriend crashed the, sort of kicked the door in and came in and was just like, what the fuck is going And she just looked at me and she goes, you're pathetic. Oh, she saw you oh, were just she, getting it on. And yeah, I was just, I was high as a kite. As a you know? She was like, really? This is, you know, this? this? Right. You know, so she kicked everybody out of the apartment, and, you know, don't want to get dressed and leave, and, uh, and she just looked at me because you're pathetic. And then she bashed me and broke my nose, and you know, I was just like, I, I couldn't argue with. Her. I was like, you know what, you're fucking. Right. It's hard to going, argue with a broken nose. <laughs> I was like, oh, she fucking slugged me, um, and she was like, you know, get sober or I'm out. Right. And I and I knew I knew it, it, it had been coming. Yeah. So um, so I got sober. I went to meetings and you know, a couple of stops and starts, and yeah, I, started, I was like, fuck, this feels good. And then at that time, a, a, a really amazing guy called. Um, Marcus Entebbe, who came to me and says, Mark, you know, I've seen you getting, you know, you've stopped doing the drugs and everybody's talking about how you've stopped cleaning up and you're doing it, but you look like a fucking monster because I put on like 20 kilos. So I was miserable. I was like, I meant to be getting healthy, but I wasn't, I, I looked like a fucking beached whale. Age, it was, age it was, is brutal, like, mate, oh, if you're man. not looking after yourself. I was like, fuck this, I'd rather, you know, go back and start, you know, not eating for a, a few days at a time and lose the weight. Because I've got something for you. You've got to start cold press juicing. You go, what the fuck is a cold press juice? Because what's this new way we take organic vegetables and we mix them and we make juices and you just, you know, you just, you know, drink juice. You don't eat for a few days. And I'm like, well, you know, he goes, I guarantee it's going to help. I, you know, at this point I'll do anything. Um, and he goes, I go, he goes, if you can do a five day juice cleanse and you can sort of commit to promoting to all your friends, this new healthy lifestyle, of which you know everybody, you know, everyone. If you can get them to start juice, and I'm going to give you a piece of the company. <laughs> right, so I was like, well, another company opportunity. Fucking done. Uh, so, so, I did, so I did the juice cleanse, loved it. Um, I was going to meetings, uh, felt so good because I was actually sleeping for once, and I was doing the juice, and I started to lose weight. So then I became that, you know, the face of the cold press the, the addictive <laughs> fucking personality of mine. Right. Yeah, I was running around Manhattan. I mean, if I wasn't partying, no one was allowed to party. So <laughs> you got a juice and, you know, like, oh, fuck, here he comes again with that bag of juices. <laughs> but they all got into it. Right. Anyway, the company blew up. Um, you know, we went what from, was the company called? Uh, the Juice Press. Right. We went from zero to a, <laughs> a massive company right. within three years. I mean, I think the, I think the thing's valued at $100 million now. Um, I cashed out. Um, I saw an opportunity. I, I, in that time, I got sober and I did. I opened up like three more clubs in New York. Um, started looking at Asia. Started to think Bali, and then they put. That's the where Bali became on the horizon. Yeah, I was like, you. "This is it. I've, I, if I stay in New York, I'm going to fucking kill myself." So, so um, let me let me see what. And then they made me a, a really good offer, um, and I took I took the offer. Cashed out, sold out, handed the baton of New York City over wow. to, you know, to the next like, to the next generation. And you already fell at that time. I'm ready to move. Oh, on. I knew it. I'm I was just like, what am I going to do? I'm, I'm, I'm over 50, the predictability. I'm fucking fifty years old. Well, like you know, hanging around twenty year old models is not a, look, a good look. So you're fifty at this point. Yeah, I'm fifty. Fifty one. Right. Yeah. Um, and um, and I'd already started setting up things in Asia, and and that was it. Bang! I got you know, I got the cash and cashed out of everything else, paid everything out that I had to. And everyone's like, Mark, but you're doing so good now. You know, why are you leaving? I said, because it's time for the next generation. Sure. And these kids, you know, now, and collectively these three or four groups of which I'm working with, one of them now, and, uh, you know, who's, who's just a, an amazing guy who's, you know, he's come up through the ranks. And they're the next generation. They, they treat 
nightlife as a business, not just as a, mm. as a, as a free bottle and stuff. And, um, and I mean, you know, and then the social media, and now, now I'm so aware because before I wasn't, I was there, but I wasn't there. You know what I mean? Now with Instagram and Facebook, I mean, I, I, I mean, I don't even, I don't sleep, but I don't sleep in a healthy way now. I wake up, I'm so anxious. I'm so happy to get up and go. So what was the, what was that defining moment to stay in Bali then? Like did, did, I, from I, there you flew to Bali I to fl see business flew to Bali, said to my girl, said, babe, you know, this is it. You know, I've got, you know, we've got Pocket full of cash. Let's is run. this the same girl or is this a new girl? Yeah, the one who broke my nose. <laughs> oh, so you did set it together. Yeah, yeah, we stayed together. We did for a while. Right. <laughs> then we got to Bali. Um, and then I started, you know, doing clubs here and um, Was the Buddha Bar here you? No. Well the Buddha Bar I was back to that quick sidebar there. No, mm. the Buddha Bar when I when I lost the venue and I was we were looking for a new venue, uh, my friends Miguel and and uh, uh and friends from Paris, uh, God rest his soul because he's dead as well. Um it, they said, Can we use the name? I said no, and then they did it anyway and okay. and started making CDs and oh, made, right. I made a fortune off the Buddha Bar CDs mm. and we, we we fell out but we made up. You know? Okay. Um, Anyway, so that was that. So back here, so now I started, I, started, I introduced juicing. I opened up a club in Samaria called The Townhouse, which is that five-story. Yeah, I remember here. I played there once. Yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah. Which, and it was great, and it was a bit ahead of its time, and, you know, Justin Bieber showed up for the opening and <laughs> this and that, and everyone was like, oh, the fuck, you know, wow, this is the hot place. But, you know, it was just, I don't know, it was just started, uh, it, it, you know, it was a little bit ahead of its time. And you know, and, and apparently the the place is haunted. And, you know, I, mean, I know I've heard. Yeah, you know, Gonzalo, so Gonzalo many, got chased out of there too. His, I that. mean, because he saw ghosts in there apparently, and the place burnt the down. Place burnt down. That's right, a whole yeah. other story about that. Yeah. So then, um, so now I started. I started this juice company uh, uh, in the raw. Um, everyone said, "Oh, you're fucking crazy." In the raw, three yeah. dollars for a juice, but now everyone's juicing, and now everyone's charging like ten dollars <laughs> for a juice. I started yeah. that company. I started organic farming. Um, up in the north during during COVID, um, that blew up. That's blowing up now. I just had a, a, a team come in and and, uh, and join join the company. Um, I got you know, restaurants in Ubud, Meru. I'm allowed to plug now. So in the raw juice, <laughs> we deliver. <laughs> Best thing you'll ever do it's is a juice. A, such a switch from the. Uh, I mean, it's you know, it's a good thing, right? You've gone from this incredible, intense, you know, drug fuel. We're going to get onto the. We're going to get onto the wolves as well. But yeah, this whole. Yeah, let's get onto the wolves because we we we'll close up soon because we're hitting an hour and a half. We're but, almost um, there. I'm, I'm wrapping yeah, up. Yeah. Um. So, uh, <laughs> by the way, this interview is going to be a series. We're going to come back tomorrow. <laughs> oh, you're going to have to come back. Don't worry. This <laughs> is this is the first mate. Don't we've worry. Skipped about 10 years. Well, we're, we're getting the whole sort of over, overview, the overview now. Of and then I'm going to, next time you're in here, I'm going to zero in on those stabbings and those <laughs> hanging oh people God, off buildings. That's right. That's right. The stabbings yeah. and the shoes. I got shot in the ass. I got a big hole in my ass. <laughs> okay. Hang on. Let's just rewind. Let's just tell us about getting shot in the ass. <laughs> I was, quick segue. I have a quick segue. I was in an argument. It, it, the guy pulls out a gun and I was blah, blah. And, you know, we what were, were you arguing uh, about? Oh, something ridiculous and stupid. I don't know. I think he flicked a, I flicked, he flicked a cigarette butt at his girlfriend and I had an issue with that. Oh, so it's a classic uh, in a nightclub moment? Yeah, it was just yeah. coming out of the club. But yeah, he, he'd been bullying her and I told him to leave. And I actually got pistol whipped. Uh, I had about 50 stitches in my head. And then, and By then, him? He pistol whipped? Uh, yeah, he pistol whipped me. Um, I, I was trying to stop it. It's a long story. Anyway, I got pistol whipped. And then I'm, I just started to, I just started to, to bolt because the guy, you know, he, he actually he actually misfired in my face twice. Oh Jesus! Um, and uh, and then started running. And then he fucking one he let one off, and it, and it came, and actually didn't misfire. Shot me in my head. Damn. Yeah, and I got stabbed in the gut by some lunatic that I wouldn't let in the club. Oh, that, so it's, it's a, very much club nightlife. Yeah, it's all injuries. look. You know, we introduced booze and drugs and yeah. people at night time, especially in in you know, cities where people carry guns and knives. I mean, it's no yeah. it's no different now. The London people are getting all you know the nightlife business course, is, is, yeah. is a tough business. You know, outside of. Everything. Else. Anyway, that, let's get back to nice things. Uh, I'm, about, <laughs> I'm wanna, all about the dark shit. You want to the dark shit? <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, it's, people get shot. You get shot. People get shot. People get st you get stabbed. I've been. You know. Oh, I mean, it's a, that's that's that nightlife, right? I mean, it, I remember when I was partying. But a lot. I can say so. One thing, but most of the time, you know, if you just put, let your ego come down a little bit. You'll avoid that situation. It's all so that, true. It's so driven mm, by ego that that fighting. I fight night. you, you know, I fuck you. And it's funny how at night in clubs, you know, someone that can be a regular dude with heaps of money out in a club and sort of, you know, I notice it here in the in the party yeah. nights of Bali. Uh, but you don't know what they do by day. They could just be some accountant sitting, you know. But they have this facade at night, and then they protect this ego when they're in that club with such veracity like if someone questions it it's like, oh you can't talk I, to me like that and then all of a sudden it's this insane physical fight well, you never know where you're gonna go because i had 
f- rewind a little bit. I'm going to edit this in different, my running. Um, I had a, my opening night at Metro CC on 17th Street. There's, you know, there was this, I, I knew he was a connected guy. I don't know if he was a made guy or not. You know, Little Frankie. Everybody knew him was Little Frankie. Of course his name was Little Frankie. <laughs> of course it was. Italian, you know. <laughs> Comes in and little hey, fucking Frankie. You know, he's wearing a fucking white suit. The guy's like five foot four, five foot six. You know, real fun. And he's got two fucking big guidos with him, what we call like, you know, American Italians. They were like, I mean, you could, they were, you could tell what they were. Mm-hmm. Comes in the club until my opening night. I'm like, hey, Frankie. He goes, hey, Moki, how you doing? You know, come in, sit down. You know, we get your table. Anyway, they got drunker and drunker. Started to become really abusive. They were sitting by the toilet, started grabbing girls out. This is my opening night at Metro CC. This is like my whole fucking uh, life has been coming to this point. Right. And then they just start making a start negative vibe. Frankie, vibe. please. You know, he goes, oh, I can't stop them. Look at them. You know, I go, you're going to have to stop because, you know, and then I'm a, I'm a couple of drinks and a couple of bumps in. So I'm getting fucking like loopy. Mm. Anyways, I, I hear the scream from the toilet. I run out there and these three guys have got a, a stall door open and they're grabbing girls as they come by and trying to drag them in the toilet to give them coke or whatever i fucking lost so i ran his shop they tried to grab me and pull me in and i lost it i absolutely went postal and i really damaged these guys really badly really like like badly i, I hurt these men didn't care how fucking big they were I was biting bits off of the fucking nose and ears and god knows what and um rewind about a month before that there was a girl who'd been getting who was getting actually a, 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 a molested in a toilet at the tunnel upstairs in the club. I'd gone in and this is one of your clubs. Yeah, no, I was the director of the club, you know, for right. for litigation, and um, and I sort of helped the girl save the girl, you know, smacked the guy around and got her out, got her in a cab, to her, got a call later on that night saying, "Oh, hi, is this Mark Baker? Yeah, it's Mark. How you doing? Because well, I just want to thank you. You know, you 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 saved my little girl tonight." And I was like, "Well, no, no issue. You know, but any man would do it, right?" This is a man, a, yeah. a father. Well, he goes, you, "Yeah, this is the father," and he says, uh, "Look, I just want to tell you, I work for a big family here in New York, and I'm an attorney, and I represent all, most of their interests, and uh, I owe you one." So, I'm like, okay, all right, thank you. Okay, goodbye, see ya. So, after the fight with the, with these fucking Guidos, I get a call the next morning. He goes, "Mark, this is me, Same guy. me again. Um, you've got a real problem because the guys that you beat up." and injured really badly, actually. One of them was really fucking bad. Um, they work for a New York family, one of the Italian five families, and uh, somebody wants to see you, the boss wants to see you. Oh, man. I'm like, oh, fuck. So, okay, so I'll let you know. Just do me a favor, come here. I'll vouch for you. Just don't say a fucking word. So we go down to Mulberry Street the next you know, next lunchtime, you know, one of the one of the social clubs down there. And I walk in and there's fucking John Gotti standing there in his cashmere coat and it's great. You know who John Gotti is? I know the name. Yeah. John Gotti? Yeah. Yeah. He's the fucking head of the Gambino crime. Yeah, he's the most yeah. feared man in fucking That's uh, why I know the name. Yeah. Next to Capone, he's the most feared man on in mm. New York history. You know, I walk in and next to him he's all Frank, little Frank. He's got bandages all over his head and he's all fucked up. He's got all these goons. I mean, I I mean I, I was could have lost my life in that in that meeting. And uh, in fact, you know, John Gotti, who was just the most infamous, I mean, he's the boss. He's the boss of the five families. You know, he's like the deal. And uh, he goes, hey, you know, that was what his name was, vouches for you, but I want you to explain this to me. What the fuck did you do to my to my guys? I'm oh, like, you were, uh, I'm like, your stomach uh, just dropping out of that uh, moment? Oh, no. I mean, I mean, I'm talking like, you know, whatever movies you've ever seen, this is like fucking times 10. These guys are like eight, 10 guys in there. Just and, knowing who uh, that and, is. And, God, if you just how do you even hold your voice together? I was, I, you know, I, I felt I was so correct, and I just said, Mr. Gotti, I'm, obviously I know who you are. Got the, you know, the greatest respect. I'm an English street kid. It's my opening night in my restaurant, and I tell you something: you would have been ashamed of their behaviour last night because they were grabbing girls in the crowd. Oh, nice call. And he fucking he looked. He goes, "Hey, Frankie, that's yeah. What, is that true?" Because Frankie had told him a different story. You know, he said ah. to him something. So poor Frankie's all bandaged up. God, he just fucking said, the fuck, did you fucking, and he, Frankie was like trying to mumble and he fucking hit him. He hit him so fucking hard on his broken nose already. He went flying. And, uh, and then, so, oh, so Frankie, you had actually beaten up Frankie as oh, well. Oh, I smashed Frankie, I smashed all he three was, of them. He was part but, of uh, but, but God, he, he told John something else and, uh, and, 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 and God, he had just turned around and said, oh, Frank, and I was quite honest, I said, look, you know, I, I, you know and, and Lewis said, had, had vouched for me as a, as a good guy. I said, look, I'm just a street kid. You know, this is my opening night in my restaurant. And you guys were grabbing people, girls, you know, vaginas. I mean, at the end of the day, he's also a business guy, right? Yeah, so he's he a business would... guy, but he's also, a, you know, he's looking at the man fucking kills people for fun, you know. But, sure. But he's also, you know, there's a code of conduct, you know. But I'm sure if I'm women sure and kids like are off that, boundaries. If they recognize 
true. Yeah. Like in true intent and true. Uh, he reasoning. got it. He got it. Yeah. But he, you know, he turned around. And he was just. I mean, there was there was a bit of dialogue in it, but you know, what I remember he just looked at me. Goes, look. He goes, you know, Lewis vouches for you. But if you, if I, you ever come across it, if I ever if anything like this ever happen again, I'll fucking kill you with my mm. bare hands oh, myself. Geez. And then, but then he turned around to me and he winked at me. He goes, "Get the fuck out of here!" <laughs> and he winked at me like, and, a, and a little smile. Wow! Well, like, Thank you, Mister Gotti. I love it. You've actually so, been threatened by Gotti. <laughs> that was <laughs> yeah, wild. not to be. And then later on, there were other sort of not run-ins. I always managed to maintain a friendship with the New York Mafia, and and you know they're in the building department, fire department. You know, half the, so, you know, the Italian fans were the cops or the gangsters. You mm. know. So I imagine that within that industry, the nightclub industry, you would have everyone, bumped into these people everyone, a lot. Everyone, the, top, the cops, the, the everyone. But you see them after, you know, sort of ten or eleven o'clock at night, or at dinner, and you know, you know, they're there, there with their wives or their mistresses mm. or whatever. So you, yeah, no, I, I, I always <clears> managed to, I always managed to, 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 to conduct the business and the clubs and get respect. Like you know, even Puffy, you know, Puffy would have a fucking crew. Crew of bodyguards, especially after Biggie got whacked, you know. Um, and I was like, no, Puff, you can come, you know, you and Jay and J Lo and, and your immediate crew can come with Jay Z and you, all, but all your bodyguards and the guns stay outside. That was our policy at Lotus in New York. And uh, and we never had, thank God, we never had any instances of shootings like some of the other clubs. Mm. So we, we, no, we, they, they had to respect the, the bit. We respect you, but you've got to respect our business. Sure. Too. So, so of, of course, you know, when you've got the hotspot, you know, every, which, which makes, them, I'm sure that makes them feel more secure. Absolutely. As well once absolutely. They're in there. Absolutely, you know. I mean, you know, I used to you know, fucking like, you know, pat him on the back and then you know pretend to drop my phone and give him a quick frisk if they're carrying a piece downstairs. You know, right. I mean, all the little tricks. <laughs> you know. So man, give, anyway, us, so, give us a rundown of the wolves. So we're going to wrap up. We're going to let's wrap up. So I come to Bali, got sober, la la la. Start the thing. My girl was like, you know, she wasn't quite finished with New York. She went back. Um, we're best friends. She just had a kid with a, a really good friend of mine. Um, all good. And then there was just this sort of void in my, you know, what the fuck, you know, and the townhouse closed and what do I do now? And, you know, again, have to reinvent myself again. Mm. Um, started doing the juice, started doing the farming and uh, always had an affinity for wolves. And uh, through some old Russian connections and friendships, you know, I was, I was, I want one of these particular, the first was a wolf dog, actually, it was a hybrid, but uh, made some calls and waited three years and eventually managed to get, um, a wolf here <laughs> from from Russia from Russia from right, Russia yeah. and then um, I waited another two and a half years and got a female. They had puppies. Um, and, and these are like, these are the one hundred percent wolves. No, they're these not the hundred. The, the first two were were hybrids, were yeah. high content hybrids. So they're like you know they're a high content. They're more wolf than dog, but they've got a bit of dog in them. Yeah. And then you know I'd always wanted the white wolf, so I you know, got the white wolf from Canada, and there was another wolf from somewhere else. There's a black wolf come in and wow. suddenly I've got a wolf. And now you've got how many wolves? In my house, I have seven permanent and in and out, probably 10, seven to 10 at all times. Wow. And then around Bali, there's, you know, there's quite a few. And it's just you looking after them? No, a... I have a whole team now. I've right. Got, and, and we move between, you know, I'm, I'm in, you know, in uh, in Changu at my place, uh, my, my home there, big, quite close to the beach. There's a big property there so they can run around. Then we've got Ubud. I take them up to Ubud where we have Meru Restaurant <laughs> overlooking the beautiful Champu Wentham. <laughs> and then, yeah, and then we've got the organic, juice, lot of juice in there. organic farms up in the north, up in Badugal, up in the mountains. So we take them up there. They love it up there. Um, Uluwatu at the weekends on the golden beaches and cliffs. Okay. Uh, so, so, so your life kind of revolves around. Moving I'm on the move, I'm on the move the whole time, mm. and uh, we've got a whole team that sort of. I'm going to take them everywhere all the time, but most of the time they're with us. So, yeah, I don't like to be without them. That's so. such a dramatic difference in in just lifestyle <laughs> and company. You know, they, people, they, you they, know they, to go from I've got New, to tell you New that, York madness to <laughs> Bali with a with a wolf pack. Hey, live your dreams. You know, yeah. If you want to, you know, always dream to have them. I mean, you know, there's a downside to not having them. I don't have a, a, a wife or, or kids. These are my families, my kids. Mm. But um, and look at all the beautiful raving lunatics on this island. <laughs> I think I, I think I'm doing quite good with a pack of wolves. Absolutely. But, I mean, there are some people. But that... uh, live you, you know, to, you know, to wrap it up, you know, life isn't fair. Don't expect it to be. Um, it will throw every curveball imaginable at you. You're going to have to, to, to you know, take the curveballs and 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 stay focused and stay true to yourself and to people around you. You know, cause and effect is real. Karma uh, is real. Um, we we are blessed to be here in Bali. Absolutely. I mean, the fucking life we have here is considering looking at the world right now and all the complications and all the anger and all the bitterness everywhere. We are truly blessed 
I don't say that. We're blessed. You know, we are really blessed to live here. I I, I tiptoe around this island. You know, uh, I'm, I'm very mindful of of every day and every action, and just and just to be a a positive influence on Bali. Considering all the talk now about people who are here that are not being positive, mm. they just have to blend into the culture and respect the culture. And um, do you do you have an overarching feeling of satisfaction with the journey you've been on throughout your whole life and where you've where you've brought it to? Absolutely. Yeah. It's you know I don't I said you know I said recently I I don't you know I, I've done things that I regret but I have no regrets. You mm. know, everything has taught me something. I'm 61. I'm, I live the greatest life for me. You know, I walk barefoot. I haven't yeah. worn shoes in five years. I, I have the greatest life. I'm surrounded by incredible people. I have great friends. I'm where I, I need to be right now. And, and do you feel like you'll be here now? For well, I'll never leave Bali. Yeah, I'm you never found leave. home. I'm done. I'm home. I'm home. I'm home. And I always knew that. Mm. You know, back in the club business, back in the day, you know, where does a you know a club I want to go? Does he go to Miami? Does he go to Las Vegas? Not a fucking chance. Mm. Bali has always been the checkout and the end it's game. It's a beautiful, like place to end it in like to you, the journey not that it's over yeah, yet, yeah, yeah. but what i mean is you know the journey you've been on and the Absolute. various chapters you've had like this is a great place to settle your feet after Absolute. all that madness. and and yeah not i mean you know that was back then looking at well like what do i do at 50 I mean, where am i going to go you know, what mm. am i going to do but 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 even now like you know bali has that thing you know if you love bali bali will love you mm. and if you get that bali feeling and that bali bug it's there's there's nothing that can beat it you can you know you can get tired of it and you have to leave, but you'll come back. Yeah. And Bali, and especially again, looking at the world right now, the business opportunities here, the quality of life here, not just for kids. There are so many people moving to Bali. Let's hope that you know everybody contributes a little bit to to you know to to the magic of the island and and, the, and respects you know the, the the culture and the and the nature here. But uh, I, there's no for me, it's the best place on the planet, and I'm sure. Many would agree. Many would agree. Well, man, it's been a pleasure having Absolute you here. Thanks for chatting through your heart. Like that's a great cap on an incredible <laughs> life. They're like really, it's a, it's a it's an incredible and beautiful story. Thank you, Dan. Um, I definitely want to zero in on some particular <laughs> moments at a future date. So, man, I'll have you back. Let's, I'm let's ha happy to sometime. come back, and uh, yeah, and, um, the, the movie's coming soon. Right? Yeah, <laughs> fantastic, <laughs> awesome, man. Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks My a lot. Absolute pleasure. Thank you, guys. Be uh, be happy. Ciao. Rock and roll. <laughs>